Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. We have a little diversion for you that may both relax and intrigue you. It deals with the subject of dreams. A great deal too much, I think, is said these days about facing reality. It is considered a great virtue to face reality, while to spend time dreaming, fantasizing, we call it now, is thought to be shameful, if not downright sinful. Personally, I would not care to live if I could not dream. Would you? I saw you coming out of her room. Did you now? Did you really? I won't have it, I tell you. I won't stand for it. Well, what do you propose to do about it? I don't know, but I'll do something. Like what? Uh, I'll tell her who you really are. Oh, come off it. Now, stop talking nonsense. You don't really know who I am. Our mystery drama, The Stuff of Dreams, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Bryna Rayburn. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Back to the subject of dreaming, which is what our story concerns itself with. Not the dreaming we do at night, which is somehow considered respectable because we think we do not control it. No, this story is about the dreaming we do while we are wide awake. You uh, sure you got the right address? I believe so. 111? That's right. Mrs. Tipton. That's right. Well, she ain't gonna come to the door. Well, why do you say that? Well, she never does. Nobody ever does. Well, somebody will today. You think so, huh? Well, you're wrong. You'll find out. I uh, lived at 113 all my life, born there. I was here when she moved in 20 years ago. Moved in and never came out. If it weren't for Mrs. Hutchins, the cleaning lady comes once a week... Uh, we think she was dead. 
But Mrs. Hutchins has her own key. Mrs. Tipton, don't let her in. You can stand there for a hundred years. She'll never come to the door. I really don't think it's any of your business. Well, I'm just telling you what I know. Look, I happen to be answering an advertisement. See? Here it is. I cut it out of the morning paper. It's about a job. Something happened to Mrs. Hutchins? The cleaning lady? Well, she was here yesterday. It's not an advertisement for a cleaning woman. What's it for? Well, it doesn't say exactly, but there's no mistake about the address or the name. Mrs. Hilda Tipton, 111 West. That's her, all right. So, see? You're the first person I've ever seen ringing that bell in 20 years. Must be something up inside there. Well, I really wouldn't know. Oh, wait till I tell my sister. Will she get a kick out of this? Oh, hey, you mind if I stand here till she opens the door? That is, if she ever does open the door, which still remains in a doubt. I do mind. I want this job. The money's very good and won't help my chances if she sees you standing there gawking at her. Why well, not gawking? I got every right to be here. Just walking my dog, that's all. I do it every day, three times a day. Trixie and I always stop in front of 111 for a couple of minutes. We got a right. Well, just the same. If you wouldn't mind... Okay, okay. Trixie's all finished anyway. Come on, Trix. We go home. We ain't wanted here. That's plain. Thank you. We can watch from our porch anyway, can't we, old girl? Sure we can. Uh, oh, what, what, what is that? Oh, that sun. That sun so bright. Well, c- c- come inside. Come in, for goodness sakes. You did say three o'clock, yes. didn't you? I mean, uh, that's what I understood on the phone. Didn't you say... Go ahead. Go on into the drawing room. Go ahead. It takes me a little time. At first, uh, I thought that maybe you weren't home yeah. or I'd made a mistake or something. <coughs> oh. Oh. <gasps> What a beautiful room. Oh, a perfectly beautiful and I, I was on the phone when you rang the bell. It takes me a while to get around. All this weight I have to carry. I have a glandular condition. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go on, sit down. No, no, not there. That's a priceless antique. I'm sorry. Well, where shall I... Any place. Uh, I'm going to lie down on the couch myself. You don't mind. Oh, I don't mind. I'll... I'll just stand. If you want to. See, I... I have a heart condition, and my weight problem makes it worse. So, I have to be careful. Well, now, you... You came about the position. Yes. Uh, what, what... What's your name? You you told me on the phone, but I've forgotten. I, I, I talked to a lot of girls. My name is May Cook. May Cook? Yes. That's not a very imaginative name. <laughs> well, it's mine. It's the only one I've got. Well, you you could change it to Maybell, something like that. Well, I don't really want to. Oh, it doesn't matter what you call yourself. I, I myself changed my name from Hilda to Hildegard, but it uh, didn't seem to make much difference because I never see anybody or correspond with anybody or, or have anything to do with anybody, really. Not ever? Not anybody? Not since my husband divorced me and took my son away from me. Oh, that's awful. Oh, I am sorry. Not at all. No, I, he gave me plenty of money and I I bought this house and furnished it. But even so, to leave you alone like that? Oh, I never think about it. Or them. They got in the way. Got in the way? In the way of what? My kind of life. Mrs. Tipton, <laughs> it's really hard to see where I'd fit in. Uh, I'm a trained social worker. That's how I make my living. At least, that was how I made my living. I was discharged six months ago. They were cutting down. and uh, Well, I haven't been able to find anything in my field, and uh, I'm running short of money, so... So I'm willing to take almost any kind of job if it's respectable. Look, I'm not going to ask you to do anything you wouldn't ordinarily do. Do you need a secretary? Something like that? I think I could manage that, maybe. Or or be a companion. I don't want a secretary or a companion. Why would I? I never do anything, and I... I prefer being alone. Well, 
What is it that you do want? I want somebody to live for me. To... To live for you? Precisely. <laughs> well, uh, I really don't know what that means, Mrs. Tipton. I never heard of anybody living for somebody else. Well, I shall explain. I don't pretend that my life in this house is living. Not what most people would call living. Though what do they know? Nothing. Actually, my life here is infinitely superior to what they would call living. Well, what, what precisely do you do, Mrs. Tipton? I dream. Just dream, that's all? What do you mean, that's all? <laughs> oh, it's easy to see you don't know much about dreaming. Well, you mean daydreaming? I know about that. I daydream sometimes. Everybody does once in a while. Yes, but how many make it a life's work? Oh, not many, I guess. Hardly anybody would be my guess. Well, people don't have the time. They can't afford it. I know I certainly can't. Ah, but I do have the time, and I can afford it. But it sounds strange. Of course it sounds strange. No one has the sensitivity or the imagination to withdraw completely into the life of fantasy. A life peopled with the oddest creatures, doing the oddest things in the oddest way, saying Incredible things, producing incredible sensations. You make it sound fascinating. But uh, uh, I'm a very ordinary person, really. I, I, I don't think I could do anything like that. Of course you couldn't. And that wouldn't be what I'd require of you. Well, I think we really ought to discuss that. Y you said you wanted me to live for you. I want you out in the world, what people call the real world. Living what they call a, a real life. And that's all? That's all. You're a social worker. You must have got around a lot. Well, some. Do you have a lover? <sighs> There's a man I'm interested in. We're not... What you said. I'm, I'm just interested in him. My, but you're a proper little thing, aren't you? Well, never mind. I'd want you to go on dating whatever you've been doing with this man and... Whatever else you do with your time. And that's all? And report back to me once a week. Tell me what you've done. I, I, I can't believe that that's all I'd have to do. You, you'd pay me for doing that? Yes. $300 a week. Oh, that's a great deal of money for just... Just living and telling you about it. Uh, I just can't see why you'd want to pay me for doing just that. Oh, if you insist on an explanation... Well, I'd I... like to understand if I can. Oh, very well. You see, I'd be better at the job, I think, if I, if I understood a mm -hmm. little. Well, you see, I'm thoroughly convinced that I've created the perfect life for myself. I live surrounded by beauty, charm. It is a beautiful house. All the senses are satisfied here. <laughs> Do you smell the perfume in this room? Yes, it's lovely. I have it changed once a month. You see those draperies? Pure silk from Thailand. One hundred dollars a yard. Oh. And they are due to be changed shortly. When you change them, do you just throw the others away? Oh, you'd like to have them, wouldn't you? Well, perhaps if you're a very good girl. Well, it's so lovely. Everything in this house is lovely. Except me. Oh, Mrs. Tipton. Nobody please. weighing close to 300 pounds could be considered lovely, but it doesn't matter. Because I have my dreams. And in my dreams... I weigh exactly 110, and my hair grows to my waist, and is a light auburn in color, and my feet are small and narrow, and my eyes are clear and bright, and my fingers are long and tapering. Oh, well, never mind. The point is that in my dreams, I am the loveliest thing on earth. And the loveliest things happened to me. And why do you... That's been my life for 20 years. And I've adored every second of it. But now... Well, I... 
I'm starting to grow older. It's sad, but I... Well, I, I'm growing older, and it's... It's harder than it used to be to... To dream my beautiful dreams. But everybody grows older, Mrs. Tipton, eventually. I don't intend to. No, no. I mean to go on living in my dreams until the very end. If there ever is an end. But there has to be, doesn't there? I mean, for everybody. Not for me. But I still don't see what you want me to do. I mean, I don't see what possible help I could be to you. I need food for my dreams. Food? They're starting to grow stale, my dreams. Repetitious. I've dreamed each one of them a million times. I, I need new ones. But can't you just make them up? No, I can't. I need some contact with life as it's lived by others. You know, sometimes lately I've... I've had the sensation that I was... I was melting into my dreams, that... I was vanishing into them. That I was becoming nothing but my dreams. But what I need now is to build a little bridge between me and the outside world. And since I clearly can't do this myself, I... I must have someone do it for me. And that's what you want me to do? Build a, a bridge for you? You think you can? I can try. I'd like to try. Hello, Eddie. Well, hello, Miss Cook. How are you? <laughs> How should I be? I know it must be hard for you. Uh, I've done time before. Oh, I feel so bad. It's my fault, really, that you're here. Well, so you turned me in. You did your duty. You were uh, a good citizen. Yes, but... So you feel bad. No, Eddie. You know I take a special interest in you. You know that. Oh, yes, I know that. You haven't had an easy life. You know anybody who's had what you'd call an easy life? I don't, Miss Cook. <laughs> You have to call me Miss Cook. I thought we were getting to be friends. Well, you know something? I, uh, I forgot your first name. It's May. May. I'll, I'll call you uh, Maisie, okay? <laughs> well, okay. At least it's better than Maybell. Maybell? What kind of a name is that? <laughs> a woman I interviewed about a job yesterday. She thought I should change my name to Maybell. <laughs> oh. Needless to say, I declined. Although I must admit, if she'd insisted, I'd have done it. The job pays so well. Wait, well, you, you got a new job? Well, it's very strange. I don't know how it's going to work out. Well, now, wait a minute. Say, it's legal, isn't it? <laughs> yes. It's perfectly legal. <laughs> okay, so what's the job? What does it pay? Well, you're not going to believe it. $300 a week. Oh, you're kidding. I'm not kidding. This woman, I don't know if she's crazy or what. She lives in this beautiful house. All this beautiful furniture, rugs, pictures. She never has any company. She never goes out. Why not? She doesn't want to. Twenty years ago, her husband divorced her and he got custody of their little boy. So she bought this gorgeous house and she lives there. Doing what? Dreaming. If she sleeps all the time? No, I think she means daydreaming, making up things. Well, so what does she need you for? To help her make up things? Well, she wants me to live for her. Uh, how are you supposed to do that? She says that all I have to do is live my normal life and once a week come and tell her about it. What's to tell? Well, she thinks if she has some sort of contact with the outside world, <laughs> she thinks that would help her with her dreams. Oh, that's what she needs, uh, help with her dreams. <laughs> and I get $300 a week. <laughs> isn't that crazy? <laughs> well, isn't it? Say something. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. What about? I, uh, come up for parole next week. I, I think it'll go through. They practically promised me. Yes, now what are you going to do when you get out? Well, I told him I had a dishwashing job, and I do. Where are but... you going to live? Yeah, it was some flop house, I guess. Well, you'll get a better job. I have great faith in you, Eddie. And if there's anything I can do to help, you know you can count on me. 
Maisie, there's one thing you could do to help. Well, what's that? When I get out of here, let me move in with you. Eddie, I... Uh, just for a little while, till I get back on my Eddie, feet. Eddie, I, I don't I'd, know. Look, I, just... I, 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 I don't mean shack up together. I mean, just, just let me sleep on the couch or the floor, anything. Well... It, it, it'd mean everything to me. Well, for a while, maybe. Okay. You can stay with me for a little while. Dear sweet Mother Nature, at whose shrine we all pretend to worship and whose dictums we constantly violate, what oddities she does create. Perhaps to revenge herself on us for our misdeeds. Perhaps to punish us for our hypocrisy. Perhaps to show her contempt for our stupidity. Whatever her reasons... It is an undeniable fact that here and there are specimens of her handiwork that shock, terrify, and appall us. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Our tender little heroine, Miss May Cook, has secured a position with Mrs. Hilda Tipton, wealthy recluse. In return for a handsome salary, Miss Cook has only to lead her ordinary life and report weekly to her employer its mundane contents. To be, in Mrs. Tipton's words, her bridge to the outside world. For Mrs. Tipton spends all her time dreaming. Just dreaming. While in another part of town altogether is a man called Eddie who spends his time in prison also dreaming. Dreaming of the day of his parole. Got the job, didn't you? Uh, she ought to give you your own key. I know she doesn't like answering the doors. Uh, Mrs. Hutchins has her own key. She lets herself in. So why don't she give you your own key? <laughs> You're getting to be as snooty as she is. Come on, Trixie. Let's not hang around where we're not wanted. We can always watch from the porch. Oh, oh, come on in, May. Hurry up. Looks like rain. Terrible day. Oh, well, go on in. Take your coat off. Go on in. I hope to goodness you've got something to tell me. Something with a little spice to it. I don't mind telling you what you tell me about the world out there. It makes me glad I don't live in it. Oh, Move that pillow, will you? Which one? On the couch, the gold one I needed for my back. That's it. Oh, yeah. oh right. go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, oh. the beginning of the week wasn't so very exciting. Oh. I bought some clothes. What kind of clothes? Well, a couple of shirtwaist dresses and... Shirtwaist dresses? Oh, they're very nice. Nice? I paid quite a lot of money for them. Oh, didn't you buy anything, you know, sexy? No, Nothing long and filmy and, you know, revealing. No, I've, I've never worn that sort of thing. But didn't you tell me you were in love with some man? Yes, that's true, I am. You wear shirtwaist dresses when you're with him? Alone with him, I mean? Well, he... he hasn't been in town lately. Where's he been? Away. Away where? Oh, you don't want to tell me. <sighs> okay. When's he coming back? Well, he is back. He... Came back last night. Oh, good. So, <laughs> what, what did you do last night, the two of you? Well, we went out for dinner, seeing as it was his first night home. What did you eat? He had steak, I had fish. We both had salad and ice cream. Oh, Lord. Even the food you eat is dull. Don't you ever eat anything interesting? We used to go to a Chinese restaurant sometimes. Mm -hmm. I bet you ate chop suey. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so... After that splendid repast of steak and fish and ice cream. And what did you do, huh? Well, we went to a movie. What movie? The one in the neighborhood. I, uh, forget the name of it. Oh, May, you could make up a name. <laughs> Why would I do that? Well, you know I never go out of this house. I don't know one movie from another. 
So if you made up the name of a movie, I wouldn't know the difference. But why should I? Because you're lying. You never went to any movie. Not last night, not after your lover's been away out of town, whatever. Now, I want the truth, young lady. I want the whole truth. You've been coming here, what is it, three weeks now, and you... You haven't said one word that was interesting. Near as I can tell, nothing happens out there in the world. Nothing, nothing whatsoever. But it's true. Nothing much does happen to me, Mrs. Tipton. I don't believe that. I don't believe that for an instant. I couldn't have been so wrong about but you. I, I never said that I was interesting or anything like that. I no, never... No, but there was something about you. I I heard it in your voice over the telephone. So, so sweet, so mild, so eager to please. And then when I met you, I... I could see it in your face. Well, I don't know what you could see. I'm just... Hunger. The earning. You wanted my draperies, didn't you? Oh, but only if you were going to throw them out. Well, you'd take secondhand things if they were fancy, expensive. And, and then there was your manner. The way you smiled and agreed with everything I said, even if I was rude. I knew you must have another side to you. What I saw couldn't be the whole of May Cook. There must be another part of her that was that was jealous and spiteful and angry. No, no and, I'm not. I'm and not. guilty. Guilty of being spiteful and jealous and greedy. No, Mrs. Tipton. Yes, no. Miss Cook. Now, suppose you tell me about this lover of yours. Tell me all about him. What's his name? That'll do for a start. Eddie. Eddie what? You said he's been out of town. He's... He's been in jail. In jail! In jail! Well, that's wonderful. In, in jail for what? What did he do? Well, he broke into somebody's apartment. Your apartment? No, no. Then how'd you get to know him? It was the apartment of a friend of mine. So when she had to go to court to identify him, I went with her. She was frightened, so I went... Now, hold on. I remember enough of the world to know that... when a person says it happened to a friend, it didn't. It happened to that very person. So, this Eddie didn't break into the apartment of a friend of yours, did he? He broke into your apartment, and that's how you met him. Am I right? Isn't that what happened? Yes. Of course. Of course. Now, how did he get in? Through the kitchen window. And you heard him moving around? Yes. What did he steal? Well, I... I... I didn't have very much. He, he, he took my mother's engagement ring and her wedding ring. I had a little cash, about $20. He took that. And what else? Oh, that's about all. I don't want to hear about... about all. I want to hear all. What else did he take? Nothing else. He took you, didn't he? I don't know what you mean. I mean he took you by force against your will. I mean rape you, Ninny. He raped you, didn't no, he? No, he didn't. Why don't you admit it? Mrs. Tipton, I can't admit to something that never happened. Oh, oh you make me sick. Well, if that's so, perhaps I'd better not work for you any longer. And give up all that money? You need it. You know you do. Not that much. Look. Look. I want you to do one more thing for me. Then we can call it quits. I want you to bring this Eddie person here to my house. I want to meet him. I, I don't know if he'd want to come, Mrs. Tipton. You I... bring him. Tomorrow night. I'll expect you both. For dinner. I've had enough conversation for today. You can go now. Oh. Your money's on the little table by the front door. Thank you, Mrs. Tipton. Three $100 bills. Crispy new ones. Thank you, Mrs. Tip. For once, I got my money's worth. And I mean to get much more. Much. Much more. That's all you told her? That I spent part of a year in a slammer? Well, there wasn't anything else to tell. Well, it just doesn't add up. Oh, what doesn't add up, Eddie? Well, that this old bag would want to meet me. I don't care how nutty she is or how lonely or how anything. That's not enough of a reason. No, 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 no. There's got to be something else. Yeah, I know what these biddies have on their minds. All the time they got it on their minds. Didn't she ask anything about that? About what? You and me. About sex, dummy. She didn't ask me. She told me. Told you what? That, that you raped me. 
Ah, I knew it. There had to be something. Well, of course I... I said you didn't. Uh, then what? Then nothing. She got disgusted with me because I wouldn't say that you... Because I wouldn't say something happened that never happened. And so I said that maybe if that was the way she felt about me, maybe I better not work for her anymore. You said that? She didn't seem to care whether I quit or not. There was just one more thing she wanted me to do. And that was to bring you to her house tomorrow night for dinner. And you said you would? Well, I said I'd ask you. You don't have to go. What do you mean, I don't have to go? <laughs> She's pretty weird. <laughs> I want to go. But, Eddie, I really believe Mrs. Tipton wants to think you raped me. I mean, I don't think she believed me at all when I said you didn't. Well, we can set her straight, can't we? Well, I don't think she wants to be set straight. <sighs> it was a nice job while it lasted. Oh, it isn't over yet. Oh, yes, it is. I've made up my mind. After tomorrow night, I'm never going near that house again. Yeah, now you're perfectly right. You, you're, you're not cut out for that job. Well, I'm glad you feel that way. Yeah, but me? Uh, I was tailor-made for that job. You? You mean you'd go to work for her? Well, why not? You said it was legal, didn't you? Yes, it's legal, but... Well, I can tell my parole officer I'm working for a rich lady who is uh, slightly eccentric. It'll sound great. Oh, Eddie, I don't know. Yeah, I... but I do know. Look, you made hash out of that job. I know I did. It's yeah, just... but I won't, believe me. I'll make it into the best-paying job in the world. Oh, you just want the money, is that it? it? Not that I blame you. I wanted it, too. But, you see, it isn't worth it. Look... Here's the $300 that I got paid today. You take it. I really don't want it, and you need it, so you take it. You're going to get some money I care about. Look, here. Three $100 bills. Hand them over. Here. Give me a match. What for? How about... Never mind. I, I, I got one someplace. What do you want a match for? I got it. Eddie. Oh, you can't... Oh, don't do that. That's $300. Don't they burn pretty, though? Well, some people have money to burn, I guess. Not me, and nobody I know either. And even if we did have, I don't think we'd go ahead and actually do it. I mean, we'd somehow think of something else, anything else to do with it beside burn it. I mean to say, hundred dollar bills are legal tender. Not legal tinder. We'll be back shortly with Act Three. It is the next night now, and May is bringing Eddie to have dinner with Mrs. Tipton. Or is it the other way round? Is Eddie bringing May to the house of a woman he has never met? For contrary to May's expectations, Eddie jumped at the chance to meet May's employer. More correctly, her former employer. For May fully intends to resign, and Eddie fully intends to take her place. It is 7 o'clock, and May and Eddie are arriving at number 111. Okay, keep the change. Well, well, well. Don't pay any attention to him. Who is he? he lives next door. Well, I didn't expect to see you. Not tonight. Remember, Eddie, this is the last time I'm going to come to this house. I got you. And with a man alongside you, too. Mrs. Tipton must be loosening up a bit. Am I right? Just ignore him. For 20 years, it was just Mrs. Hutchins went through that door. Then the young lady makes an appearance... Now, lo and behold, a young gentleman. Uh, why don't you just go on home, huh? I live next door. Well, go there. Okay. Come along, Trixie. We'll sit on the front porch and watch what happens. Ah, oh, there you are. I've been waiting. Come in. Come in. That was the most delicious meal I've ever been privileged to enjoy, Mrs. Tipton. Uh, better than prison food, Eddie. Well, I haven't always eaten prison food. I'll just bet you haven't. Oh, May, 
Fetch Eddie another helping with the burnt almond mousse. Yes, Mrs. Tepton. Uh, Eddie. Hmm? You remind me of somebody. I, I can't think who. I... Uh, your husband, perhaps? Oh, heavens no. My husband was a stick. Your son? Well, considering I haven't seen my son since he was five years old. I... Now, now you're more like... Like someone I've dreamed about. Is your dessert, Eddie? Well, just settle down. Uh, when you're finished, maybe you'd like to see the rest of the house, Eddie. You've seen the first floor. Maybe you'd like to see the second floor. Oh, now, that would be a privilege. <laughs> my bedroom, I think, is my masterpiece. It's, it's in shades of beige at the moment. From ivory through parchment to ecru. Though I may change it. Let, let, let me look at it first. Oh, I will, I will. I've never seen your bedroom, Mrs. Tipton. Uh, no, you haven't, have you? And I once promised to show it to you, didn't I? Yes. Well, then we'll all look at it together. Eddie, finished your mousse? All finished. Oh. Oh. I really should have an elevator installed. These, these stairs are... Getting to be too much for me. Ah. Voila. Entrez. Oh. Oh, how perfectly. How perfectly exquisite. Uh, it's oh. very nice. I commend your taste, Mrs. Tipton. Oh, you really like it. Yeah, yeah, I really do. But but you said you were going to change it. Oh, I change everything regularly. I get tired after a while. I need new things, new colors, new textures. New sensations? Most of all, new sensations. Well, I uh, have some thoughts on how you could redecorate this room. Oh, have you indeed? Oh, I wouldn't change a thing. Who asked you? Oh, it's just an opinion. I'm interested in Eddie's opinion, not yours. Well, why don't you go downstairs and clean the table? Uh, yeah, wh why don't you? And uh, wash the dishes. Well, I'd prefer to stay here. I wasn't hired to clear the table and wash the dishes. And nevertheless, just this once. This one time. Not this one time. Not any time. Uh, May, step outside with me for a minute, huh? Outside where? Well, just outside in the hall. What for? Well, for a little conversation, that's all. Now, come on, come on, come on. After you. All right. Just for a few minutes. Now, look, I want five minutes alone with Mrs. Tipton. You really want to work for her? You want to do her living for her? I really want to. Eddie, you don't know what she's like. Oh, I know exactly what she's like. She's another one of those women. I've known them all my life. What women? Women like you. Oh, she's nothing like me. Not outside, but inside you're alike. You're the kind that likes criminals. You like everything about them. If I wasn't a criminal, you wouldn't like me. I wanted to help you. To understand you, to help you to understand yourself. I understand myself perfectly. I understand myself backwards, forwards, sideways. I, I'm, I'm bad, Maisie. Bad, no, bad, no, bad. No, not really. Yes, no. really, really, she understands her, that fat blob in there. I'm what she's been dreaming about all these years. Lust and lasciviousness and uncontrolled passion. Dreaming of a life where anything goes and the world belongs to the clever and the strong. Oh, I'd never lived that way. I've never dreamed about those things. Oh, yes, you have, baby. You haven't got the gumption to do anything for yourself. So you find somebody like me and pretend you want to change me. But you, you, you want to rehabilitate me. Isn't that what you call it? Well, I can't be rehabilitated, baby. I don't want to be. And that fat lady in there doesn't want me rehabilitated. She wants me just the way I am. So now, if you'll excuse me. Eddie. Ah, uh, Mrs. Tipton. Well, you've turned off all the lights. <laughs> the moonlight comes through the windows. Well, how romantic. Moonlight streaming through parchment silk. And where are you, Mrs. Tipton? Here, Eddie. Why, now, would you by any chance be in the big canopied bed, Mrs. Tipton? The the big bed draped in ivory net? Silk net. But I can scarcely see you. <laughs> you can hear my voice. So I can, Hilda. Oh, call me Hildegard. You said I reminded you of someone. Someone I've known intimately. Well, suppose I light a match and you take a look at my face. 
Think who it is I remind you of. You ready? Oh, yes. Why? Why, I know you. I... I know you. You... Is it possible? Is what possible? That you... are him. The fiend. The arch fiend. Am I? Oh, light another match. Look carefully at my face, Hildegard. Oh. Is it possible... You're here, here with me, and you are going to... To what? You're going to force yourself on me, aren't you? Oh, I know it. It's what I've dreamed of. Oh, light another match, my beloved. Your majesty, your satanic majesty, I am your servant, your, your slave. Oh, oh, what is that? The room is growing red, this... There's fire. The, the bed is on fire. I'm, I'm on fire. I'm fire. <laughs> Mrs. Hutchins? Mrs. Hutchins? I'm in a hurry. Oh, terrible thing about the fire. Terrible. That beautiful house. Though I've never been inside, of course. Have they uh, been questioning you, the police and the fire people? Yes. Well, they'll get around to me later. Me and my sister. No doubt. We were the ones who called the fire department, you know. Didn't uh, they tell you? No. Oh, yes. My sister and I heard this sort of explosion. And then we saw smoke coming out of... One of the upstairs rooms. Mrs. Tipton's gorgeous bedroom. Is that what room it was? Yes. Then she must have started it herself. I wouldn't know about that. Well, nobody got out, I understand. Nobody. Where was Mrs. Tipton at the time? In her bed. They found her there? Yes. And uh, uh, the young girl, Miss Cook, I believe her name was? Outside the door. The door to the bedroom? Yes. And the door was locked. Why, the poor girl must have been trying to get in to save Mrs. Tipton. It looks that way. But where was the man? What man? The man who came to the house with the young lady. There was no man. Well, of course there was a man. He drove up about dinner time with the young lady, and they went into the house together. Now... He never came out because my sister and I watched the house back and front. From that moment on, we were so surprised to see a man going in. No man was found in the house. Well, wait till they get to questioning me. I'll tell them about the man that went in and never came out. You'll only be making a fool of yourself. Well, it must have been the man that set the fire. The fire started in the bedroom and the door to the bedroom was locked. And no body of any man was found, so there. Now, I've got to be getting on home. You can tell your fanciful tale to the police if you want to. But how did it happen? How did the fire start? It was the work of the devil, if you ask me. He has sly ways, the devil has. Very sly ways. And all their pretty dreams went up in smoke which, I am given to understand, is not an uncommon fate for dreams that are too remote from reality, and in particular, dreams of violence. These especially are doomed to end in smoke and fire and death. So, dream away, my friends, as I shall continue to do. But be careful what your dreams are made of. I'll be back shortly. Revels now are ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded 
with a sleep. As so often happens, the final word is given to the one who says it best. Master William Shakespeare, born 1564, died 1616. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Bryna Rayburn, Jack Grimes, and Dan Arco. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Sleeping pills? Very mild. I could give you one. No, thank you. I don't... What's that? No, what? no, no. It's just the telephone. It's strange at this hour. Shall I answer it? Yes, please do. Hello? Oh. Well, just a minute. The operator says Mr. Bomer is on the wire. It's an emergency. Will you take the call? An emergency? Well, of course. Hello, operator? Yes, you may put the call through. Here you are. Hello, Mr. Bomer. What? What, what are you saying? Who are you? No, 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 I won't listen. Oh, Miss Radlover, what is it? Are you ill? You're so pale. It... It was not Mr. Bomer. Not Mr. Bomer? Who was it? I don't know. Someone who said... Someone who said they would kill me. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. A hunting party in search of moose gets separated in the Canadian wilderness. One of the party members is abducted by the legendary Wendigo a novella written by Algernon Blackwood. The Wendigo Author Robert Eichmann once said of the story it is one of the possibly six great masterpieces in the field. The Wendigo by Algernon Blackwood. You can hear the entire book absolutely free on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Buy a satchel, if you please. There, that one in the corner will do. The scarlet one. You see, scarlet is my favorite color because it reminds me so very much of blood. about, Sam. Sit down. Do you have a smoke? Yes, of course. Do you think Mr. Craig knows what we're doing? I believe he suspects. What are your plans? Tonight, Peter Craig will sign over the last of the estate to me. And when do I get the money you promised me? Within a week. Why that wait that long? Because it's the best that way. You should wait longer would not do for the private nurse, Rose Esther, to become suddenly rich overnight. You remember the price, don't you? One hundred thousand dollars. I should have more. You are netting a cool million. The deal was all right with you when I made it. Yes. Yes, it's all right. What time tonight? About eleven. When he's good and sleepy... We'll take the powder without suspecting. You said he already suspects. Not everything. He doesn't know we give him dope to make his mind go blank. We can be pretty sure of that. Or that he signs those legal papers while under the influence of the drug? He couldn't possibly know that. 
He's been taking medicine for so many years, when you hold a glass of it in front of him, he takes it automatically. He has one more paper to sign? One more. I'll give him the powder the minute you come into the house tonight. After that, disappear. Yes, I will. But remember, Sam, I expect my share of the money within a week. I think I've been quite patient with you since we went into this thing. It wouldn't be wise for me to become suddenly impatient. All right, Mr. Goodwin. Sit down, sit down. Thank you, Mr. Craig. Nurse, hand me my glasses on that table over there. I can't see a thing without my glasses. Your medicine, Mr. Craig. Eh? Medicine. Oh. Oh, all right. Thank you, nurse. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> you get my glasses. Here they are. Do you wish warm milk before going to bed tonight? Warm milk? No, no, not on your life. And don't you go locking my laboratory tonight. I'm going to tinker around in there a bit as soon as Mr. Willard leaves. Yes, sir. Just ring if you need anything, Mr. Craig. You look well, sir. I never felt better in my life. Now, what's on your mind at this hour of the night? Well, Mr. Craig, I've been handling your legal affairs for quite some time now. Yeah, yes, yes, you, yes, you have. Uh, seven years, I believe. Just so. This afternoon, I stumbled upon something that absolutely astounded me. And what was that? I happened upon the deed to your estate. I noticed it had never been turned over to you in a legal manner. <laughs> well, it's a small technicality, but I thought I should advise you about it. Have you done anything about it? Why, yes, yes, I have. That's why I came out tonight. I have the papers with me. Put everything in perfect order. Uh, I say, Mr. Craig, is something wrong? No. No, I... I'm just... I'm sleepy. I, I'd better sign the paper now. Yes, sir. I think you'd better. Here, Mr. Craig. On this line right here. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. Here? Yeah? That's right, That's all, Mr. Craig. Thank you very much. This is just exactly what we needed. Just exactly. Nest! Huh. Oh, no. There ain't no better than to leave me here in darkness. Nurse. Nurse, come here. Come here at once. She's not here. She's gone. She's gone. And left me. When it's so dark, so still. Left me here to die. You no, know, I can't stand darkness. You no, know, I, I can't be left alone. You know, you know my, you know, my heart. Uh, servant, Alex Monroe, I bequeath the sum of $5,000. This is my will. All that remains, aside from the foregoing, is for Mr. Samuel Willard, my attorney, to carry out the duties I already have outlined to him. Herewith, attest my hand. Peter Craig. And that is Mr. Craig's will. I wish to assure you that the last portion... A portion concerning the duties involving myself have been carried out. They have to do with the funeral itself and the preparations for the funeral. I wish to thank each of you for coming here tonight to hear the reading of Mr. Craig's will. 
You will each receive your individual shares of the estate in the next two weeks. Now, good evening. Well, Rose? They took it quite well. Why shouldn't they? After all, they were only his servants. He had no relatives. It didn't strike any of them as strange that Craig should have left the bulk of the estate to me. You played your cards very well, didn't you? I think so. The smartest thing was giving the servants a share. Yes. Now, I I suppose I'll receive my share. Of course. Within a week. Good. Would you mind answering a question for me? I know. What is it? Those instructions about the funeral. I saw nothing unusual about them. There wasn't anything unusual. But... Just what were the secret instructions Mr. Craig left for you in a sealed envelope marked to be read immediately following my passing? Oh, that. He just stated he wished to be buried in the family vault. But there was something strange at that. Yes? He directed me to his laboratory, a certain compartment where I found a box wrapped in brown paper and tied with a heavy cord. He instructed that this box was to be buried with him. And was it? Yes, I had it placed in a coffin. Do you know what was in the box? Yes. I don't mind saying I was curious, so I opened the package. Well? It wasn't anything worthwhile at all. Just a couple of pounds of modeling clay. Modeling clay? Yes. What in the world do you think his idea was in wanting to be buried with such an insignificant thing as modeling clay? This way, please, Professor White. Uh, Thanks, Mr. Willard. Peter Craig, as I've told you, was an old friend of mine. I I certainly was surprised to arrive here and learn he'd passed on. Yes, we buried him last Thursday. Mr. Craig had no relatives. I didn't know the names of any of his friends, and that's why you weren't notified. Mm -hmm. I I once worked with Mr. Craig at Oxford. He could have been a professor there, had he wished. Professor? Mm -hmm. Uh, Here. Down these steps. Yes, he was quite an electrical engineer. Worked miracles, almost, with wires and tubes and batteries, condensers, all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, I knew he liked to fuss around in his laboratory. I've only been inside the place once. Didn't know he was a master at any particular science. Oh, you? yes, indeed. He was one in a million. Always experimenting. <laughs> always trying some new idea. <laughs> Uh, Here we are. This is Mr. Craig's laboratory. I I see. This wax on the door. Oh, that. Uh, The police sealed the place up when they were investigating the death of Peter Craig. Investigating? Yes. Mr. Craig died unattended. Heart attack. He fell and struck his head. At first, the police feared foul play. Oh, I see. Oh, I suppose it'll be quite all right to break the seal now. Oh, certainly. We've forgotten all about it. Ah, there we are. Now. I'll go first, Professor White. Light switch is very inconveniently placed. Okay, sir. This is what you wanted to see. Yes, sir. Just as I thought. Table after table and shelf after shelf of electrical equipment. Seems pretty much of a mess to me. (laughs) Poor old Peter Craig. He never was very tidy. I came in here the day the police were around, just before they sealed the room up. I'd never been here before. All these wires and electrical panels and tubes and things give me the creeps. Craig certainly could put weird contraptions together. He spent many hours here. I believe his experiments were the only things that gave him a desire to keep on living. Mm. Say, uh, here's a strange-looking workbench over here. What do you mean, Professor? Well, uh, look for yourself here. See, the tabletop is littered with short lengths of almost invisible copper wires and with little bits of fresh putty. 
Putty? No, it's not putty. It's it's modeling clay. You? Yes, you're right. Yes, and here's a cardboard box of this tail. That that box, the brown paper, this heavy cord. Yeah, why well, it appears that there was a great deal more of the clay in this box. You can see that a good portion of it has been torn away from the original mass. It's the same box. The very same one I put into the casket. What? What could Peter Craig have been doing with modeling clay and thin copper wires? Mr. Willard. Yes? Is that the only entrance to this laboratory, the, uh, the one the police sealed? Well, yes, it is. No windows, no other door. And yet that, uh, that seal was unbroken. We both saw it was. Yeah, but look here on this, on this workbench here. These bits of clay... Still moist, not dry and hardened like they'd be if they'd, if they'd lain here long. And this hand towel here, look at it. Damp, as though someone had just recently dried his hands on it. Mr. Willard, what's this, do you know? A locket on a golden chain. Where did you find it? Oh, here on the floor near the wall over there. His picture is a child inside. You know what's in the locket without opening it? Yes. It was Peter Craig's request that he be buried with this locket in his hands. Hello? Yes. Yes, this is Rosester. Who wishes to see me, clerk? Well, if he won't give his name, I certainly am not interested. He said to tell me he's the man with the scarlet satchel. The scarlet satchel. Oh. No, I, I don't wish to see him. Send him away, please. Tell him to go away. Tell him to go away. Peter Craig. Good evening, my dear. You, the man with... With the scarlet satchel. I, I remember when you bought it. You took me with you. And when I suggested a black or brown colored bag, you said... I said that scarlet is my favorite color because it reminds me so very much of blood. Yes. Oh, no. No. Oh, this isn't true. It can't be true. Peter Craig is dead. Yes, my dear. So he is. But you were Peter Craig. I was Peter Craig. Once upon a time. Now... I am merely an old man with a scarlet satchel. What is in that satchel? <laughs> I am just returning a gift, my dear. A gift? Oh, it was a most excellent jest, I know. But hardly becoming of so charming a person as yourself. What do you mean? Do you remember the modeling clay? Hmm... I see you do remember. It was, it was merely a joke. We sent it to you only in fun. We? And Mr. Willard and I. Oh, yes. Mr. Willard. <laughs> well, I never did tell you how much I appreciated receiving a child's plaything from two such thoughtful people. But now I've come to return the gift. Go away. You... You're some imposter, pretending to be Peter Craig. The real Peter Craig is dead and buried. I am going, my dear. But I leave the gift with you. You'll find it there in the satchel. <laughs> You'll find its contents most interesting, I'm sure. And now, good night, my dear, and goodbye. He's gone. It, it isn't true. Peter Craig is dead. I saw him buried. Oh, this is just a horrible dream. 
<laughs> yes, I, I'll wake up any minute now and... That satchel. Scarlet. More scarlet now than it ever was. There on the floor where he left it. Opening. Yes. Opening. And yet, there are no hands to do it. Something inside. Something is opening that satchel from the inside. What? What in the name of heaven is that thing? Oh, no. Oh, stop. Stop, I tell you. Keep away. Keep away from me. No. Uh, Miss Esther was a friend of yours, Mr. Willard? Yes, she was. Mm. <laughs> and that newspaper certainly gives a startling account of her death. Yes. Rose Esther was heard by neighboring tenants screaming hysterically. When investigators broke their way through a locked door, they found the nurse sprawled upon the floor of her living room. Both the girl's hands were clasped tightly to her face. Her eyes were staring blankly, wide with terror. Her last gasping words were, Scarlet Satchel. The terror-stricken girl undoubtedly died from fright. Scarlet Satchel. Yeah, sounds like a murder plot from Sherlock Holmes. Scarlet Satchel. Just a minute, Professor. Still Willard, man. Don't jump like that while you startled the life out of me. It's gone. Gone? What's gone? He kept it here in this closet. I remember when he bought it. Who bought what, Mr. Willard? What in heaven's name are you so excited about? The Scarlet Satchel. He always kept it here. Now it's gone. I still don't understand what connects... The cemetery. Me. That's it. We've got to go out to the cemetery. Come on, Professor White. We've got to go out there and see what's happened to the grave of Peter Craig. He's gone. Peter Craig's vault has been opened. Opened? As though someone inside had pushed up the coffin lid to escape. That lid was heavy. Peter! Peter Craig! It was so difficult for an old man to push up so much weight. But Peter, what on earth is, is, is the explanation of this? They told me you were dead and buried, man. Then for once, my good friend, they told the truth. Yes, he is dead. I saw him just after they found him. He'd been dead for hours. His heart had stopped. Rigor mortis had set in. Yes. I was a perfect corpse. Peter. He was taken to the funeral parlor. Embalmed. He lay in his coffin a day and a night before we buried him. Mr. Willard, there's some explanation. I here. saw them close the coffin on him. Saw them bring it out here. Watched them put it into the vault and seal the door. And Rose Esther witnessed the same thing. That's why I startled her so. You killed her? You killed Rose Esther? No, not I. She was killed by the thing in the Scarlet Satchel. The Scarlet Satchel? Professor White, look, he's carrying it now. There is one plan in the entire scheme of things mortal man does not know. That those who are murdered... Never rest easily within their graves until they have wrought a full and perfect vengeance. Murdered. They left me alone, alone in the darkness and stillness of a night to die. They knew that my heart couldn't stand the shock. It was as much murder as if they'd stopped my heart with a dagger thrust. No, 
No, no, I had nothing to do with that. You and your friend, Miss Esther, once thought it very hilarious when you sent me a child's plaything to the mails. At the time, I was not amused, Mr. Willard. Now I am. The clay modeling set. Exactly. Peter. Peter, man, what are you doing? The scarlet satchel. He's opening it. I'm taking out my little pygmy friend. Peter, that thing looks alive. No, no. Oh, it can't be. It's nothing but a little figure modeled in clay. Just a little clay doll. It can't be human. Then watch it come to life. Peter. Good heavens. It's moving. Walking like a man. You see? I have put the modeling clay to good use. I have created with it your damnation. No. No. Keep it away from me. Don't let it come any closer. Keep it away, I say. Don't let it touch me. Stop it. Keep that deadly thing away from me. Don't let it touch me. I can't stand it. Don't let it touch me. heard The Man with the Scarlet Satchel, the 16th original tale of dark fantasy by Scott Bishop. Ben Morris played Sam Willard, Fred Wayne was Peter Craig, Georgiana Cook took the part of Rose Esther, and Muir Height was heard as Professor White. Next Friday night at this time, listen to another startling and weird dark fantasy adventure, Superstition Be Hanged, written by Scott Bishop. Tom Paxton speaking, Dark Fantasy originates each Friday night in the studios of WKY, Oklahoma City. This is the National Broadcasting Company. I've often joked about how instead of an energy drink, I need a motivation drink. They just don't exist, or so I thought. I was told recently about Magic Mind. They wanted me to consider promoting their product, but I never endorse anything unless I've tried it and approve of it first. After taking Magic Mind with my morning routine every day, along with my vitamins and my coffee as always, in less than a week I was feeling more focused, more alert, and surprisingly more motivated. I'm spending more time on what's important and getting more accomplished when doing so. My mood is better, making each day less stressful. Magic Mind is doctors validated. It has over 200 scientific studies behind each of the ingredients, like cognizine cytosoline, it's the best nootropics on the market, the highest possible grade matcha, organically grown mushrooms from California, and more. Magic Mind uses nano encapsulation technology. It helps your body to absorb the good stuff that much faster and more efficiently. So, I gave them my stamp of approval. I even signed up for a monthly subscription of 30 bottles before telling them I approved. And now Magic Mind is giving you, my weirdo family, a special deal. Up to 48% off your first subscription or 20% off one-time purchase with the code DARKNESS at checkout. Go to magicmind.com slash darkness and then use the code DARKNESS at checkout. Johnny, what's happened to New York? I'm not with you, Lee. Well, we've been here two weeks. Two whole weeks. And no crime has come our way. I seem to remember statistics to the effect that uh, a major crime is committed in New York every 75 seconds. Well, they certainly haven't been coming our way. Well, for my money, it makes a nice change. You know what I feel like? I feel like watching the boxing. Watching? But Lee... Yeah, yeah, I know. I can't watch. But that's what I've got you for, isn't it? You're supposed to be my eyes. Well, we'll combine a little business with pleasure tonight. Okay. I want to see the big fight at the garden. So we'll go along. 
And you'll see how good you are at explaining to me exactly what's going on. <laughs> I want a blow-by-blow -blow description of the fight. And heaven help you if I miss a blow. Goodyear presents... The Sounds of Darkness. Good evening. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, makers of passenger, truck, and tractor tires for every requirement in South Africa's farming, commerce, and industry, bring you Lee Masters, the blind detective who challenges the sounds of darkness. Tonight's Sounds of Darkness, you will hear Tony Jay as Lee Masters, James White as Johnny Bridges. Other than the cast are Louis Eiffe, Adrian Steed, George Carellin, and Hugh Rouse. Now let's join the world of Lee Masters in tonight's Sounds of Darkness, The Last Round. Sailor Pavosky's coming down to ring now, Lee. He's uh, prancing around the ring, holding his hands over his head. <laughs> They've made him favorite. He's six to four on the sailor. Uh, you fancy him? Yeah. Well, me, I reckon Tiger Jackson will stop him inside six. Oh, you got to be joking, Lee. No, no. Tiger Jackson's well over 30. This guy's young and he's prime. Yeah, I know, I know. Sometimes, you know, a couple of dozen fights under your belt stands you in better stead than five years the right side of 30. And this sailor guy now, he's uh, he's had nine pro fights, that's all. Ah, uh, yeah, I know, Oh, I but... know, I know, he's won them all. Six of them are knockouts. But I still like the title. Oh, here he comes now. <laughs> Not such a reception as the sailor, huh? He seems kind of... I don't know. Kind of what? Well, he's not looking around and smiling the way the other guy was. He's walking kind of slow. His head's down. You know, Stella, looking at his feet. He's getting into the ring now. He's not playing to the crowd at all, this guy. He's going straight to his corner. He's sitting down. He doesn't look much to me. What's, uh, what's Sailor Powalski doing? He's standing in his corner, hands along the ropes behind him. He's sort of leering at Tiger Jackson. His Polak sure looks confident. Well, when you get a fighting pole, he's usually pretty cocksure. You say Jackson doesn't look so good. I've certainly seen better. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, a ten-round contest at the world of weight limit of 147 pounds. On my right, at 140 pounds, Tiger Jackson! Sailor Polonsky. They're certainly with the pole, all right. He's got them both in the center of the ring now. I give him the old routine about breaking clean and so on. Quiet a minute, Johnny. Huh? I want to listen to that riff. Oh, now, don't tell me you can't. Quiet. Break, break, break. 
Hmm. Hey, what can of the horse didn't win? What can I help it if the horse I back robbed home by 20 lengths? <laughs> Since when's the crime to back a winner? Since you fixed it so the favorite would lose and doped your horse to make sure it won. That's when. You're going to have to prove that cover. Me, I ain't say nothing until I see my lawyer. All right, you bum. Shake hands now, and when the bell goes, come out fighting. That ref, Johnny. Who is he? What's his name? Look in the program. Now, don't tell me you could hear anything he was saying over the racket going on. I heard. I can't remember the name, but I've heard that voice before at the wrong end of an interrogation session. It says here his name is Lucas. Snowy Lucas. In a pig's eye, his name is Lucas. I remember now. Yeah. His name is Bolt. Piggy Bolt, they used to call him on account. That's just what he looked like. A pig. You know, this, this guy looked that way. Yeah, now you come to mention it, he does. Johnny, my little warning bell is ringing like crazy. You've got to keep your eyes peeled. Might be a false alarm, but... I have a feeling that something crooked is on the program for tonight. He's in trouble. He's down, huh? Hank Jackson's knocked him down. Hey, it didn't look like knockout punches to me. Just two little taps to the mouth. First, they didn't seem to do any harm, and then all of a sudden, the guy drops like he's been poleaxed. Hey, how about that? The polack was poleaxed. <laughs> What is it, Johnny? What's the matter? Havelski isn't moving. He's just lying there. They're trying to bring him around. Not a chance. Hmm. Hey, that guy really is out. How do you figure that? A little tap and he's still unconscious. If he is unconscious. You don't mean he's... I don't know. But with Piggy Bolt around, it's only natural that things should smell. Come on, let's get moving. I want to be in the dressing room when they carry that guy in. Sailor's manager. He's hurt bad. I don't feel any pulse here. He's not breathing. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's got quite a lot to answer for. This was Pawalski's last round. He's dead? Are you trying to say my boy is dead? He's dead. And just to make the party complete... His breath smells of bitter almonds. Potassium cyanide to you. What is this? I don't know. What's all this anyway? Who does this guy think he is? Okay, you better sit over there. And what is all this anyway? To my way of thinking, the murderer must be one of you guys. Where are you getting that, copper? Your first, Tiger. Oh, me? 
I don't know nothing. I mean, uh, for why should I want to meet at a bum? I had him beat anyway. Sounded like a great fight tonight, Tiger. Uh, thanks, Scott, but I don't know nothing about it, honest. You're next, Collie. Uh, this is a lot of nonsense. Why would I want to harm my own boy? Why should I Name go to... first. Who are you? Collie Blake. I'm the sailor's manager. I was in his corner tonight, like I am every night. You was talking about Patar, whatever the name was. Well, I don't know nothing about that. Everything went like it usually does. I don't see how anybody could have slipped a guy a mickey. Well, we'll see about that. Tell me, Collie, the water bottle. Yeah? Did Sailor drink between rounds? A fighter don't drink between rounds. Very, very rarely. He takes a swig from the bottle and he spits it out. He maybe gargles a bit. But not very often does a fighter drink between rounds. Well, that way he'd get sluggish, you know? Yeah. I see. You got that water bottle, Johnny? I got both of them here. One from each corner. And I got the buckets they used to sponge them down. Good. All right, next. Well, I'm Snowy Lucas. Uh, I was ref for the fight. I can't tell you nothing. Oh, uh, yeah. Mr. Lucas. That's right. Would it have been at all possible, in any way, for anything to have been introduced into Sailor's mouth from Tiger's glove? Huh? Come again? You... You mean, could the guy, uh, Tiger, could, could he have had this poison on his glove and pushed it in the sailor's mouth? That's what I mean. Hey, now listen, I didn't do nothing. I'm not asking you, Tiger. Well, Mr. Lucas, would it have been possible? No, no, not a chance. You see, when they goes down under the canvas, when their gloves touch the deck, before they start fighting again, it's the ref's job to grab the guy by the wrists and rub the gloves on his shirt, the, the ref's own shirt... Well, that way you get rid of the rosin, you know. They, they, they put the rosin on the canvas so the guy won't slip. Well, a dirty fighter will try to keep this on his glove. So that at the first opportunity, he can rub his glove in the other guy's eyes and temporarily blind him. Yeah, that I know. Yeah, yeah well, like I said, tonight's fight was clean. There was nothing like that. Uh, when Tiger did go down, I made sure he wiped his gloves clean. Yeah, I see. Well, there's just one thing that worries me, Mr. Lucas. Yeah? What's that? The fact that your name isn't Snowy Lucas. Huh? It's Piggy Bolt. And the last time you and I talked, you were dodging a rap for doping a racehorse. Yeah, you won a lot of dough that time. You know, wait a minute. Maybe I... you also won a lot of money tonight. Maybe you backed Tiger Jackson to win. And maybe you made sure he did win by poisoning Sailor Pawlowski. Maybe somehow, when you wiped the rosin off Tiger's gloves, you managed to rub some poison on him. Him must be nuts. Maybe. Maybe not. But it's a possibility, isn't it, Piggy? It's a possibility that could send you right to the chair. <laughs> You're listening to The Last Round, tonight's Sounds of Darkness, brought to you by Goodyear, the greatest name in rubber. The lab report on the gloves, eh? Yeah. What do they say? No trace of sign. I'd not a thing. you was nuts. So you did, Piggy. Well, it looks like it maybe lets you out for the time being. Say, how long have we got to stay here? Till I find the murderer. Yeah, but it's one o'clock in the morning already. Yeah, that's right. It is. All right, who's next? My name's Wilkie, Jess Wilkie. I'm in his tiger here. And you were in his corner tonight? Sure, I'm his second, too. Uh, what do you know about this? Honest, Mr. Masters, I don't know nothing. My boy was doing good tonight, and he would have won anyway. I had nothing against this, sir. I mean, why should I? My boy was the better boy, and it was all set to win. So why should I follow it all up by giving them poison? Anyway, I, I, I was never anywhere near him. So the lab reports show no traces of cyanide in either of the water bottles, or the buckets, or on the sponges, or the gloves. Is that right, Johnny? That's right. 
So how in the heck can somebody give a fighter in the middle of the ring, in Madison Square Garden, in the middle of the fifth round, a fatal dose of poison? Can I talk to you a moment, Lee? Well, I wouldn't leave this bunch alone with the body. All right, I'll tell you what. You got a guard outside? Sure, I got four fellows from the central precinct. Okay, let them escort this bunch of beauties into the dressing room next door and keep an eye on them. They're not to talk to anybody. And while they're at it, they may as well search them. Yeah, you can't search us unless you got a search warrant. Well, now, you're quite right there, yeah, Piggy. I know I am. But I tell you what the position is. Either you let us search you here and now without a warrant. Huh? In other words, you cooperate with the police for a change. Or else I'll personally see that they tie a charge on you for resisting an officer in the execution of his duty. And you'll do six months before we even start. Well, hang on, wait a minute. And I'll search you anyway. By force, if necessary. Huh? So, what do you got to say to that? Well, well look, I, I'm not beefing. I, I'm sure you can search me. I got nothing to hide. That's mighty nice of you, Piggy. I'll say it is. Open the door, Johnny. Okay, Lee. Officer, take this uh, chorus line round into the dressing room next door and keep an eye on them till I let you know. Sure thing, Mr. Masters. Come on, you guys. This way. Yeah, I'm all right. All right. Well, Johnny, what is it? I was thinking... Seems like the only way anybody could have poisoned that guy would have been to have given him the poison in the ring. That, Johnny, is the problem. I know it sounds impossible, but that's just what must have happened. But, Lee, I'm telling you, it didn't happen. Look, think back. Think hard. In between rounds, between the... I was at the fourth and the fifth rounds. Yeah. Anything happened? Anything at all? Cheapest, Lee, I don't think so. I mean, you know, the usual stuff. You know, like rubbing the guy's muscles, fanning him with a towel, giving him the water bottle, all that kind of jazz. Nothing special. You sure? If there had been anything, I'd have noticed. That I'm sure of. Uh, which leaves us right back where we started. Somebody poisoned that guy while he was in the middle of the ring, watched by 6,000 people. <laughs> you get, Johnny? Lucas or Bolt or whatever his name is was telling the truth. He backed to Gran on Tiger Jackson to win. Nobody else had a bet. But I ran into Droopy outside. Oh, is that who's with you? Yeah. Yeah, that's me, Mr. Lee. Well, you might be just the guy I want to talk to. Guess there's not much goes on in the sporting world, either on the level or crooked, that you don't know about, is there? Well, I keep my head to the ground. Now, what's the word on the killing? Killing? Somebody dead? Maybe. How was the money going? What was the betting like on the fight tonight? I mean, uh, last night. Ah, you mean Sailor Pawlowski and Tiger Jackson? Yeah, there was big bread floating around on that one. A lot of dough, huh? Uh, you asked me, the syndicate climbed in on this one. As big as that, huh? Yeah. And these guys don't open their eyes under a hundred grand. Uh, the way I heard it, they stood to win half a million bucks. And they won, of course. Of course. When the syndicate bets, that ain't a gamble. That's a certainty. One way or another, they make sure of that. Yeah. Okay, Droopy. Thanks a lot. See you around. Uh, here's something for your trouble. Oh, gee, thanks, mister. It wasn't no trouble. For you, Mr. Lee, it's only a pleasure. You know that. Sure, sure. Have a drink anyway. Yeah, okay, Mr. Lee. I'll see you around. Well, very interesting, Johnny. Yeah. As I remember the fight the way you told it, Sailor didn't look as if he was losing until he dropped in the fifth. Is that right? That's right. And in spite of the fact that I fancied Tiger, Sailor was the obvious one to win, wasn't he? He started out as unfavored. Yeah, that's right. You know what I think? What's that? I think the Sailor was going to take a dive. Hmm? I think it was all arranged that way. And for some reason, he... 
changed his mind. By this time, it was too late. Uh, the syndicate had already laid out close to a quarter million bucks. He had to lose. That's why he was killed. So now we know why. But we don't know how or who. Uh, just let me think a minute, Johnny. When you've eliminated every alternative, what you're left with must be the modus operandi. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Now, so far, we've eliminated the fact that he might have been given poison before he came into the ring. Uh -huh. He didn't pick up poison from Tiger Jackson's gloves. Uh -huh. He didn't get poison from the water bottle. True. And there were no traces of cyanide in the buckets. We've searched every one of these birds, and every one of them is clean. Of course. Why didn't I think of that before? Well, I must be slipping. If I'd seen the fight tonight instead of you telling me about it, I'd have solved this thing before we got up from our seats. What are you talking about, Johnny? You know something? I think I know how this thing was done, and I think I know who did it. Trouble is, I I haven't got the faintest idea how I'm going to prove it. Okay, okay, gentlemen. I've called you all back in here to tell you that in any moment from now, you can all go home. Oh, that's the nicest thing you've ever... All of you, all of you, except one, that is. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'll tell you why Sailor Powalski was murdered. And this isn't guessing. We've checked, and we know. About two weeks ago... The syndicate approached Sailor through a third party and offered 20 grand for him to take a dive. Sailor agreed. The third party clinched the deal and took the 20 grand. When he went to give Sailor his share, the pole had changed his mind. No amount of persuasion on the part of this third party could get the Sailor to throw the fight. Now, our friend, Mr. Third Party, was in trouble. The syndicate had laid out big, big money. Sailor had to lose. On his form, he was a cert to win. So, Mr. Third Party, the murderer, hit upon a bright little scheme. He got hold of some prussic acid. Yeah, and I know where he got it from. The poison was put into a soluble capsule, long and thin. And then... The capsule was put into the sailor's mouth. What are you talking about, copper? Your brother-in-law develops photographs, Collie. Bet there's plenty of potassium cyanide lying around his darkroom. Yeah. You put the capsule in the sailor's mouth, didn't you? You're nuts. When did I get that chance? Before round five started. In the ring, in full view of 6,000 people... You slipped the capsule in his mouth. Oh, the gum shield. Of course, the gum shield. That's huh? right. That's right, Piggy. Who handles a fighter's gum shield? Only his second. Prove it. I'd like to see you prove it. Just before the fifth round started, you slipped Sailor's gum shield back into his mouth. Only this time, the cyanide capsule was stuck to it. You knew. You knew with a couple of punches to the mouth that the capsule would burst and that the sailor would swallow the poison. And that's the way it happened. Doc, talk. Just talk. Prove it, copper. I have proved it. That gum shield went to the laboratory. They found the traces that I need. Why, you... <laughs> Get him, Johnny. <laughs> All right. All right, I did it. What could I do? It was him or me. You know the syndicate. If sailor had won, they'd have rubbed me out for sure. I didn't have no chance. Thanks, Collie. I got three independent witnesses to your confession apart from the police. Take him away. Okay, come on, Collie. Uh, come on now. Come on. Okay. Well, maybe I'm not such a bad gambler after all. A gambler? What are you talking about? I didn't have that gum shield tested. What? It wouldn't have done any good. 
In the first place, all traces of cyanide would have been washed off it by the saliva in the mouth. And in the second place, it wouldn't have proved anything in the first place. You were bluffing? Yeah, I bluffed him into squealing in front of witnesses. He'll make a full confession down to the central precinct. That's the only way we could have got him, Johnny. Next time I suggest a night off watching the fights, uh, just sock me one, will you? Tonight's Sounds of Darkness, presented for your entertainment by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, makers of world-famous passenger tires, truck, and tractor tires for every requirement in South Africa's farming, commerce, and industry. Join us next Friday and every Friday night at 9.30 when Goodyear will again present the blind detective Lee Masters in... The Sounds of Darkness. The Scary Best of My Haunted Life 2.com, a collection of chilling true stories of the paranormal submitted to the My Haunted Life 2 website, compiled and edited by G. Michael Vasey. Ghosts, shadows, demons, and poltergeists. For those who experience such things, the paranormal is very real and very frightening. The stories in this audiobook cover all of these paranormal phenomena and more. Creepy ghost stories, chilling black-eyed kid stories, haunted houses, haunted hotels, shadow people, poltergeists, and more. The Scary Best of My Haunted Life 2 by G. Michael Vasey, narrated by Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Lights out for the devil and Mr. O. It is later than you think. supernatural and the supernormal, dramatizing the fantasies and the mysteries of the unknown. We tell you this frankly so that if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these imaginative plays, we urge you calmly but sincerely to turn off your radio now. This is Mr. O. Arch Over. Who among us, you, I, has not said at some time or other, if I wouldn't die, if I could live forever. Well, that's the play I've written for you. Live forever. And it begins after a mortal message from your station. And now, if you haven't already done so, turn off your lights and listen to Live Forever. Don't be frightened, John. Please, don't be. Yes, I know I screamed, but don't be afraid for me. I'm all right, really, I am. No, no, don't say anything. Just listen. The reason that I screamed, it made me happy. Oh, what are you... Oh, I know it sounds confused, but I can tell you freely now for the first time since I've known you. Tell me what? About what happened. Tell you about myself, and then you'll understand, and then we'll both be happy. Remember, you once said you never could be happy with me. Oh, please. Oh, please, don't say anything. If you do, I want to hold you in my arms. 
And I've got to talk this thing out first. Talk it out from the time before I knew you until a few moments ago when I screamed and frightened you. You know, you were right. I've been a coward. But not of men or things or living. Just of not living. You don't know what I mean, do you? Must I say it? Must I say the word? All right, I will. I've been afraid of death. Yes, believe me, Joan, all my life it was that way. Even as a boy, I couldn't be happy because of him. So one thought was in me all through life. If I could only live forever, if I wouldn't die, if I could only live forever. The thought chasing itself in a never-ending circle. So there was no happiness. And the fear in me was in my face and in my work, and you knew it, and everyone knew it, but they didn't know why. No! Tonight, the echo that is still in my ears, I cried out in fear in front of everyone. And I'm going to tell you why I cried out, and then you'll understand me, and why I say I'm free and happy for the first time in my life. And, Joan, if it's too strange to believe, just listen patiently. We were sitting in the auditorium, you and I, the politician up on the stage talking... Talking. In this coming election, I repeat again, the issue will be clear. An issue made clear by our glorious party. You young men and women... Sitting there, you next to me, I wasn't listening to him on the stage. I was thinking the same infernal thoughts I thought all my life whenever I was alone. Of him. And it's a challenge to you. And then... Yes, to you. To every one of you here. A challenge that we must accept. Face and challenge in turn. Speaker's voice wasn't the same. I looked up. No, not the same. The other one, an old man, this one young. Couldn't quite see his face, so dark in the hall. Had something happened to the lights? I turned toward you, said, Joan, when did the lights... I stopped. You, you weren't there. Believe me, not there. Another woman. Did you speak to me? She said that. I said, where... Where's Joan? Joan? Well, she was sitting right next to me. She... You have her chair. Where did she... I mean, the young lady who was sitting here, where did she go? I've been here for hours. But she was here. Here, I tell you. Quiet. Quiet, the speaker. The time has passed for pleadings. The time has passed for petitions. We are representative of youth, and youth is the time for action. So we must act. The speaker, yes, act. what did he matter? Act. I sat there, couldn't figure it out. You, Joan, where had you gone? Could I have dozed off and you slipped out and this other woman taken your place? Yet, how strange you're leaving without a word. And then, wind. Wind in the auditorium. I looked up. The sky. No roof. A single star and clouds. No roof. Sleep? No, awake. I got up to go. No, no, sit down. No one can leave. But my friend... You have sworn to stay. You must. I sat down. Sworn to stay? What in the world... I sat down. You know there can be no compromise. There will be no compromise. For if we compromise, we are doomed as they have always doomed us. Speaker, what did he matter? No roof on the place. Crazy. How could a roof disappear in a moment without... I said to the girl, where's the roof? What's happened to this place? Where are we? You know. No, no, what? Well, I'd get out of the place. I'd find you, Joan. Started to go again with the girl's hand tight on my wrist. No, don't. You swore to stay. Swore? You swore. They swore. He speaks the truth. But what? Listen. Listen. Good then now, good friends. Let us put an end to words. This meeting of ours was destined. For 500 years, destined. What was he saying for 500 years, destined? For what? None of us can say we have moved quickly. For in the meditation of these 500 years has come the essence of truth. A truth that burns bright in the hearts of all of us. What kind of a political speech was that? And so an end to words. In this meeting we have spoken words which none dare question. Now the time has come for action which none dare deny us. The girl leaned close and whispered. None dare deny us. Deny us? Deny what? Wanted to yell out just the way I did a few moments ago, but I couldn't. Something about the place, the speaker, people around me. I, I could only sit there, questions pounding in my head. Youth is action. Action is youth. We will act together and make ourselves a new world. A better world. Our world. Right. Meeting over. Everyone getting up. The girl said... Come with me. Where? 
You know? I know. Crowd pressing around me. Dark, strange faces. Young, angry faces. None of my friends. My friends? Where were they? Joan, where were you? The auditorium in ruins. As she led me out, I saw that. It was madness. Yet a strangely intriguing madness, so I walked with her. Led me through a door. I could hear voices. She said... Stand here a moment. I want to talk to you. Tell me, why do you act so strangely? Don't you want to go through with it? Through with what? There. That's what I mean. You talk as if you don't know. I couldn't speak. Stood there. It's a glorious morning for all of us. We've waited 500 years, some of us, for this. 500 years? What was she... I said, 500 years? Well, perhaps not you, but I've waited 350 myself. Well, what did you say? 350 years, and now I can't wait another moment. The thought of another empty day suffocates me. Am I insane or you? Insane? I don't know the word. Out of your head. You or I? You are a strange one. And yet you came here. Why? Well, to hear a speech. So, to hear but not to act, eh? You will. You will. All of us will. And then, the moonlight from under a cloud. And then, her face. I saw her face clearly for the first time. Hers was a loveliness beyond the word. Sixteen. Seventeen. She couldn't have been more. Freshness of the morning. And yet, her eyes, old, bright, wise... So strange, her old eyes and that young face. I stood there, staring at her. I tell you this, if one of us fails, we all fail. And that can't happen. Remember that. Now come, they're waiting. Followed her. A room, quite dark. Many people in it. Quiet, please, quiet. There is little time to waste. We will now draw lots. Each of you take a paper as the box is passed. Most of the slips are blank. Only 24 are numbered. Whoever draws a numbered slip stays. The others go. Slips? Draw lots? What was this? Draw lots for what? Someone came close, held out a box. The girl said... Take a paper. I did. She did. The others did. She said... Look at the slip. I did. A number. Eleven. She said... Good. I too. Held out the paper in her hand. I saw the number twelve on it. You and I. You and I. She and I what? All those without numbers leave. All those without numbers, please. The push of bodies around me. And in a moment, there were only a few left. The girl at my side, motionless. Now we can risk lights. And in a moment, lights began to glow. I stood there, blinking, and then... I saw... Twenty-four people in that room, men and women. Twenty-four, I counted them, and... All of them looked alike... Yes, alike, I tell you, men and women, and their faces as the girls. Twenty-four faces alike as copies of pictures strung along the wall. They, in turn, were staring at me. Who is he? A voice said. Who is he? Another said. No, I've never seen him before. Who is he? Who is he? Sir, they came close around me. Not one of us. Who is he? Who is he? Not one of us. One of us. Who is he? All those faces alike, staring, talking, staring, talking. The girl spoke. I knew it was she because her hand was on my arm. Leave him alone. He is an Atavar. Atavar. An Atavar. Oh, an Atavar. Atavar. Atavar? What was an Atavar? I wanted to speak, but she spoke. He'll be all right. I'll see to that. But an Atavar is unpredictable. Did I tell you he'll be with me? He drew 11. I drew 12. He'll be with me. But they're undependable. You know that. Never can tell about an Atavar. But I'll take care Never of him. Never can tell. I'll take care of him. They stood there arguing about me, Joe. Yes, arguing about me. Whether I could, whether I would, whether I was reliable, unreliable. And always that word Atavar. Atavar? Atavar? Mad dreams or mad adventure. Whatever it was, I didn't know. Their argument stopped. Apparently, the girl had won. The leader said, All right, Atavar. You'll be with her. Now, all of you Listen. This Atavar is with us, and with us he'll stay until it's ended. Ended? Ended? What had begun? What would end? One question, Atavar. What is your age? My age? You want to know my age? Well, didn't you hear, Atavar? What is your age? The girl said... Tell him. My... my age is 25. What did you say? 25. Do not joke. Tell us your age. I told you, 25. For a moment, no one spoke. They looked at each other, shook their heads slowly, shoulders shrugged. A Natavar, just a Natavar. The girl said... Don't worry, any of you. I'll take care of him. He'll do as he's told. Do as he's told? Do what? 
told it or what? I wanted to open my mouth. Then I didn't, because the leader said... All right. Our last word. There are 24 of you. 12 pairs. Each pair will go out together. If one fails, the other will succeed. But when? Now, at once. We have waited long enough for them. I alone have waited 400 years. And I, 200. I, 300. I, 425. I understood. Like a blow on the head, I understood. These people, mad. Yes, that was it. Talking of living hundreds of years, out of their heads, all of them. Listening to them, I knew that. 340 years. I've waited 170 years. And that explained the likeness of their faces. Some sort of weird interbreeding of a family resulting in feeble-mindedness. Well, how did I come among them? Went outside. The girl with me, everyone going off in pairs. Their faces tense, angry, going off to some strange madness. The girl said... Wait here. I'll get what we need, then we'll keep our appointment. Wait here. Joan, believe me, as she went off into the darkness, leaving me there alone, I swear my head was spinning as if it were on a pivot... And as it spun, the thoughts in my head spun with it. Madness, dream, madness, dream, madness, dream, madness, dream, madness, dream, madness, dream. What was happening to me? Madness. And then a thought. Madness, dream. Had what I'd feared all my life happened at last? Madness. Had I died? We leave our The Devil and Mr. O story of Live Forever. For a short message. Now back to our The Devil and Mr. O story of Live Forever. Dead. 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 Joan. Dead. I remember the wind Dead. suddenly was cold about me. Dead. But I was. Dead. Colder. Dead. Was I? And then someone was standing by me. Not the girl, but a man. Smooth, young, handsome face with those old, wise eyes looking at me. He said, You have not started yet, Antovar? No. No. Strange I've never seen you before. There are so few Antovars. You know, generally, they are not permitted to develop. And looking at him, I knew I was alive. Of course. And dream? This was no dream. Yes, there are so few Antovars. I said... Atavar? Atavars? What the devil are Atavars? <laughs> you are a strange one. Well, tell me, what are Atavars? Why call me an Atavar? Well, because you are. You're not like us, you know. You are a throwback to the individualistic, unconditioned, embryonic development. Why? <laughs> but then, of course, you don't understand, do you? No, an Atavar wouldn't. Well, tell me. It is strange that they should have permitted you to develop and not to have explained to you the difference. What difference? What? <laughs> Once in every 2,000 births, and that means once in every 2,000 years, we don't have many new ones in this world, you know, something happens in the incubation process, and instead of one of us perfected ones, one of you develops. A throwback to ancient times, an imperfect creature, out of the past. In other words, an atavism. Understand? An atavism. Atavism? Atavar? Atavism? What the devil's name was this? But he kept talking, he said... Yet, Atavar, though you are, life must be miserable for you as it is for the rest of us. Life? Miserable? Well, of course. Why else would you have joined with us? Oh, this is going to be a glorious night for us. But not for them. I... I don't understand exactly what... <laughs> of course not. Things would be confused for the Atavar mind, wouldn't they? That's the infernal trouble with our minds. Things are much too clear and concise and understandable. And they bred all the confusion out of us a long time ago. Well, now they'll pay for it. Please, tell me... Just look at me. I've lived just a handful of years, 250. He said that, Joan. Just believe me, 250 years. And yet, believe me, Atavar, I'm weary unto the death we'll never know. Death we'll never know. What good is there in it for any of us living forever? Living forever. For the first 50 years of our lives, they condition us. All right. We come out with our brains filled with all knowledge of all time. Paragons all. Geniuses all. But what good does it do us? What good? Always they are in the way. They? <laughs> Look, Adava, you can't be so completely a fool that they would never have let you out. They are the old ones. And what is interesting and exciting in the world, they do. They and no one else. 
And we who came after them, after they conditioned the world against sickness, illness, age, and death, we have nothing left to do. I see. They hold the key positions. They. And we stand by and grind the weary years away in nothingness. A world of youth full of the want to do and there's nothing to do. And yet there are worlds out there where we might go, but again they stand in our way and say, no, it shouldn't be done. They. They, the old ones, all around us, holding us down, giving us everlasting life, and then giving us nothing to live for. But this night will change it. You and I and the rest of us, 24. Well, here comes your partner, and I must go with mine. Goodbye, Adabar. Good luck. He was gone. And then the girl at my side, under her arm, a small black box. All right, we can go now. She took my arm. We walked along. In almost a moment, we were in a straight, broad street. Straight, shiny, glistening, bright with a light I've never seen. A quiet, empty street. Clean, and bright, and strange. As if in a dream. A dream? This was no dream. And then she said... In here. We stepped upon a platform. Part of the sidewalk. It was moving. Carrying us swiftly. Swiftly down the street. An escalator... Moving sidewalk, I don't know what. Faster, faster, things rushing by. Strange towering buildings. And then I heard that she was talking to me. I saw you talking to Auro. He has the easy one. We've a hard one. 250 years, he said. Auro? Yes, that's true. Lived 250 years? It isn't much, I know. You must be older. Or are you? Hard to tell them in that of our. How old are you? I? Four hundred. Four hundred years, but not of living. What do you mean? You know. They, with all their years. Before we were born, they took the work of the world, and what is left for us? To wander up and down, pretty ornaments with empty lives. But they forgot one thing. They left ambition in us. And this night we'll find a place to use it. How? Adivar, you are a fool. You know and yet you don't know. How can we find a place for ourselves as long as they do as they please? Listen. In the very ancient world, men lived a few years and then died. And they thought that was horrible, but that was good. For when they died, there was a place for youth. Yes. One would fall in his place and a young one took his place. Sometimes he did better than the one who had gone before, so the world progressed. But now no one falls, no one dies. And so the old ones stay and stay and stay, and we, the young ones, have no place. And when we want to make a place, the old ones say no. The thing we were riding climbed higher. Higher. And still she talked. We pleaded in petition, and they do not listen. So tonight we act. You and I, Adivar, one of 24. Act? By turning back the time to when men died and gave the younger ones their place. What? The wrong of each man died with him when he died in that old world. And so tonight we'll see that wrongs are given their belated rest. How? You and I, Adivar, we'll do our part. Up there. She was pointing up. I looked up to where the building ended. In a cloud. She sits up there. Five thousand years she's lived every day since the day science shut out death. Five thousand years, but tonight we begin to live. Here. Into my hand she thrust the black container. I said, what? You'll do it. You. In a moment we reach the spire. She'll come out old smiles and happiness. They can be happy, the old ones who have the work. Do it then, you must. What? Throw it at her and she'll be free of life and we'll be free of life without living. You'll do it, Adabar, you will. Throw it at her. Throw it? What? The thing in my hands? What did she mean to free that person up there from life? In my hands. Then suddenly I realized some kind of explosive. She expected me to throw it at that person up in the tower. Me to kill. You will. You will. No. No. The word tore through my head and with it tore away confusion. I knew. I understood. This was the world of the future where science had doomed the death I feared. Men lived forever and these young ones had no chance. And now they were out to kill and make their chance, and I was to kill for them, with them. You will. You will. You will. No. You will. You will. Not you will. My world. Not you will. Mine. You I will. Back. You will. I'm saying that. I you will. Won't. There she is, the matriarch. Throw it. Throw it. I won't kill. Not I. I won't. Give it to me. Give me that. Give me that. No. I jumped. Falling. I was falling. 
through the horrible space of that horrible future. Down and down and down. The glistening sides of the building rushing past me. Down. Twisting. Clawing at the air. Down and down. And then I remembered in my arms that explosive. I tried to throw it, but my hands tight around it. I couldn't unlock them. The ground coming up. I screamed. And there I was. Sitting next to you. In the hall where I'd been before. The politician upon the stage. My friends around me. You next to me, frightened at my cry. <laughs> Tacked above me. So here it ends, Joan. Sitting there, I stepped ahead in time until a day when men had conquered death. And so somehow I... I'm not afraid of him, the one at my shoulder anymore. Because I think it's good that men should live, then die, and so end the evil in them, and give their place to others. Tell me, Joan, do you agree? This is Mr. O. R. Jobler. After that, are you quite content to live out your three score and ten? Personally, I don't know. Wonders ahead, horrors ahead. I'd kind of like to be there and see them, wouldn't you? The next play? Well, it all began when I accidentally pushed the wrong button on an elevator in a department store and found myself not in the bargain basement where I expected to be, but a great deal lower than that. Let me tell you all about it after a short word from your station. This is Mr. O once more. As I said, I pushed the wrong button on the wrong elevator in a department store and found myself in the sub-sub basement. Not the basement where the bargains are found, but that unknown basement where goods are delivered to you. This all happened in Chicago. As those of you who live in Old Windy by the Lake may know, there's a great network under the city of underground tunnels that deliver merchandise long after the day people are asleep to the department stores. Well, I got to thinking, what would happen if... <laughs> but as usual, that's next time. It's titled, Going Down. It is later then you think. When I was a little kid, I used to get a magazine every month that had a page of hidden objects, people, or animals to find. Later in life, I had fun with those books where you had to look for the guy wearing glasses and red and white striped clothing amongst a sea of other people. Many mobile games now are centered on finding hidden objects to get to the next level. We humans love searching for lost items and finding them. Maybe that's why we're so fascinated by cryptids like Bigfoot, always hiding, waiting to be found. That's what the book Your Bigfoot Expedition is all about. The perfect gift for the cryptid connoisseur. Be that a friend, family member, or yourself. Dozens of pages of gorgeous, original paintings by artist Timothy Wayne Williams, with a Sasquatch hiding in each and every one of them. Some are more easy to find than others. Some are hidden so well you would swear there wasn't one. But there is. Your Bigfoot Expedition allows you to travel across the country through all four seasons of the year, from the comfort of your own home. Find the creature in each scene, then challenge others to do the same. The perfect coffee table book for when you have people visiting. Find the book Your Bigfoot Expedition by Timothy Wayne Williams on Amazon, or click on the store page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Diary of Fate. Fate plays no favorite. It could happen to you. Book 89, page 
754. In the Diary of Faith. Yes, here it is. The name Paul Reese. Occupation, sports reporter. Yes, Paul. Journalism once fascinated you. But after a few years, newspaper reporting had become for you nothing more than a hard, tiresome, poor-paying job. A job that forced you to deal constantly with men of wealth, fame, and power, and yet never permitted you actually to ascend to their level as an equal. That feeling caused you to choose for evil. And then I, fate, intervened. And in your life, a little thing happened. You forgot your pipe. And because of that little thing, in a matter of minutes, you will be dead. <laughs> you yourself have uttered the words of your death sentence. In a moment, I will write again under the name Paul Reese. When I have written, I will read from The Diary of Fate. of Paul Reese now lies open before me. And for a brief moment, I, fate, look ahead to an instant of crises in his numbered days. I understand perfectly, a rat. Paul, Paul, wait a minute. Let me explain. Paul, put down that book in. Paul, ah! Yes, Paul. In that instant, I, fate, fashioned the final link in the chain of circumstances that soon will result in your death. It is truly said that trifles are the sum of life, and it is also true that trifles may add up to the end of life. It is ever thus a bus missed by second. A door left ajar, a fuse blown out. Trivia? Yes. And yet in my hands, these little things become immeasurably important. You see, they are the tools with which I, fate, who am but the instrument of a plan, shape your destiny. Remember, Paul, how it all started? You had finished dinner in your fiancé's apartment. And you and Carol were finishing up the dishes. Ah. Oh, Paul, be careful. You'll chip the plate. Ah, no, I won't, honey. Oh, Mr. Reese, after we're married and have our own dishes, things are going to be different. Oh, yeah, by that time, Carol, we'll be too old to care. Oh, if you weren't so stubborn, we could be married next week. No, honey, you know perfectly well how I feel. Yes. You just don't think we have enough money. That's right, we don't have. My chances of ever having enough as a sports reporter are slim. Very slim. But you're wrong, Paul. I'm perfectly willing to keep on working. In fact, I want to, and my cashier's salary added to yours. Now, and... wait a minute, Carol. Paul, I love you, and I want to be married to you just as soon as possible. Why, plenty of young couples get married on a lot less than we're making. Now, listen, Carol. Someday I'm going to get a break. When it comes, I intend to be in a position to grab it. That's the time to talk about marriage, and not before. All right, Paul. All right. Ah, uh, that's better, baby. Look, honey, how would you like to see that new Nat Finston musical at the Orpheum, huh? We can't afford that. Well, I'll call the paper and see if I can get a couple of Annie Oakley's. Fine, that's the part of your job you should appreciate. Hello? Give me a city desk. Oh, hi, Charlie, this is Reese. Hey, listen, have you got a couple of... What? Oh, but I'm off now. I'm at my girl's house. Oh, I don't care if he is sick. But, but Charlie... 
All right, all right. Where is it? Oak Ridge Terrace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What's the matter, Pearl? Oh, I'm sorry, honey, but a guy on the night beat is sick. There's a hot suicide out in Oak Ridge. i got to cover it. Oh, Pearl. Well, you see, that's what I mean about this job. Some rich babe blows her brains out and everybody gets all excited. Well, if I finish in time, I'll call you. Hello, give me a desk. Oh, Charlie, this is Reese. Listen, I've been all over this district and there's nothing going on. Absolutely nothing. That suicide tip was a complete phony. Yeah, they're having a great, big, thrilling, four-handed bridge party at the address you gave me. Yeah, that's what you lost up my entire evening for. Ah, uh, skip it. It's too late. You were angry when you slammed out of the telephone booth and strode to your car. But then I, fate, intervened. And a little thing happened. You fumbled through your pockets for your pipe. But it was not there. You had left it in the telephone booth. So you returned to the drugstore and walked back to the booth. But the door was closed now, and a man sat inside. You stepped close and looked in. Yes, your pipe was there, on the shelf beneath the telephone. You started to move away when the man's voice filtered to you through the door. It's a perfect frame, I tell you. Fine. The boss will send the money to your place for a messenger Saturday night at 8. Yeah. 50 grand, Arthur. Huh? Oh, yeah, he knows your new place. 711 Ardmore, right? Goodbye, Arthur. <laughs> Because of a little thing. Because you forgot your pipe. You overheard a man talking on the telephone. The conversation meant nothing to you. But yours was a reporter's brain. And unconsciously the salient facts were filed away in your memory. The next morning you were making the rounds of your sports beat. And you stopped at the office of Rocky Nelson. Pipe manager. Oh, sure, Ree, sure. My boy's in the pinker condition. He's a three-to-one favorite already, you know. So if you want to make some easy scratch on the uh-huh, side... Ah, no thanks, Rocky. It's still a big gamble no matter what you say. Anything can happen in the ring. <laughs> you know, Reese, you're a smart boy. You know, just between you and me, I never bet on a fighter. Never had anything to do with gambling. Rocky Nelson? Huh? Or oh, the phonograph? No, no, that goes... That's not for the office. That should be delivered at my house. Yeah, that's right. 711 Ardmore. It's a new place. Yeah, okay. Oh, you uh, moved into a new place, huh, Rocky? Yeah, but I don't like it much. Gonna get me a farm out of town. Been in this racket a long time, and I'm getting tired. One of these days, I'm gonna retire. Yeah, we all say that. Only I'm gonna do it. Yes, Paul, as you left the office, something about the interview troubled you. Then suddenly it hit you. Rocky's address. It was the same one you had heard the man in the telephone booth mention. Now your brain began to work. Soon you would remember almost all of that sketchy conversation. Fifty thousand dollars to be delivered by messenger Saturday night at eight to Rocky's address. But the name mentioned was Arthur. Then, on an inspiration, you called Rocky. Oh, this is uh, Reese again, Rocky. Say, that new place of yours on uh, Ardmore, got any vacancies in it? It's not an apartment house, Reese. It's a cottage. And there's a rat. Oh, I see. Oh, and one other thing, Rocky, while you're on the wire. Uh, what's your uh, real name, your first name? I, I, I want to do a feature on you, you see. And, uh... Your name? Sorry. Arthur Nelson. Oh. I don't care for it. I like Rocky. Arthur, huh? That's just what I expected. What do you mean? I mean, Arthur, that you and I'd better get together and discuss a little business proposition. Something about the fight Saturday and the arrangements that have been made. What? What do you know about that, Reese? 
I'll meet you in 30 minutes at the Pelican Club. And don't be late, Rocky. <laughs> Never mind how I found out, Rocky. I know. I know the whole setup. Your boy Biff is three to one to win, but he's going to lose. He's going to take a dive for which you were to be paid off at your house Saturday night at 8 o'clock. All right, all right. It's a fix. So now what are you going to do, Mr. Wise Guy Reporter? Well, that's up to you. Okay, five grand. Come on, Rocky. Come on. Oh, you dirty chiseler. Okay, I'll go ten. Well, get this straight, Rocky. We're not playing marbles. You're getting $50,000. I want half. Why, you cheap two-bit reporter. Come on, let's have an answer, Rocky, and fast, or I'll do a story on you that'll blow you sky high. Okay, okay, you win. I'll split with you 50-50. Yes, Paul. Because of a little thing. Because you forgot your pipe. You had an opportunity. You had discovered a gambling conspiracy. And you decided to sell your silence for $25,000. But even that was not enough. The odds of three to one were there. And there was no doubt of the winner. It was too appealing to you to be ignored. Somewhere you had to find money to wager. And then you remembered Carol and her position as cashier. Carol, how many times do I have to tell you? This is not a gamble. It's a sure thing. I don't care, Paul. If we use that 5000 from the store, we'll be stealing it. But nobody ever has to know, honey. Look, Saturday you take the cash as usual. Only you're too late to make the deposit at the bank, see? So you take it home. We borrow it just for Saturday night. And by Monday morning, you can make the deposit, and we've got $15,000 for ourselves. And nobody's the wiser. Oh, Paul, it's wrong. I, I don't know how... Oh, Carol, honey, listen to me. I told you that someday I'd get a break. Well, this is it, and I intend to ride it out to the limit. You want to get married, don't you? Oh, of course. You know I do. All right. And bring that $5,000 to me Saturday afternoon. Very well. I'll do it, Paul. Now another link was added to the chain of circumstances closing above you. Now there could be no turning back. You would follow the road of your choice to its inevitable end. And soon, I will read again from your record in The Diary of Fate. an evil choice can lead only to ordained destruction. But you, Paul Reese, were not thinking of that as you sat near the window of your room the next afternoon and stared vacantly at the rain falling on the deserted streets below. It was almost one o'clock when Carol arrived with the $5,000. Oh, Paul, I'm worried. Stop worrying, Carol. Now, you just sit down and relax while I call Rocky and see about placing this money. Just think about Monday and the 15000 that five grand will bring. Rocky Nelson. This is Paul, Rocky. I uh, want to place a little folding money on the fight tonight. Can you take care of it for me? How much, Paul? Well, it's uh, 5000 Exactly $5,000. Five grand, huh? Yeah, yeah, I think I can handle it for you, all right? I'll tell you, be at my office at uh, 3 o'clock this afternoon. Okay, Rocky, I'll be there. So long. Carol, we're all set. Rocky will take care of everything. Yes, Paul. Rocky would take care of everything. In his way. For only an hour later, he stood in the rain and talked to an underworld character. Yes. Rocky was taking care of everything. Even your death. So this is my proposition, Tony. Yeah. You get rid of this Paul Reese, and I'll make it worth your while. Mm, it's a price, Rocky. Five thousand. Exactly five thousand mm. dollars. You sure this guy won't give me any trouble? No, he's sure just... he isn't somebody big? 
No, no. He's just a punk newspaper kid. Now, what do you say? Yeah, you see, okay. Fine. Now, here's the setup. Yeah. Reese will be at my office at 3 o'clock this afternoon. I'll get him out of there by 3.15. You'll be downstairs in your truck. Yeah. In my truck. It's raining. Three steps from the curb. Then there's an accident. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> All right, honey. Pull in and park over here. Well, I thought Rocky's office was on 3rd Avenue. It is. But you wait over there across the street in that drugstore, eh? I'll only be a few minutes. All right, darling, but please be careful. For me, Paul. Oh, for the love of Mike Carroll, nothing can go wrong. Nothing. <laughs> Hello, Paul. How's it go? Oh, fine, fine, Rocky, fine. Everything all set? Yeah, yeah, I'm in great shape. Ah, you got the dough with you? Yeah, right here. Five thousand. And thanks for the deal, Rocky. Ah, skip it, kid. I figure business is business. You got the drop on me, and that's all there is to it. Besides, things will even out in the long run. <laughs> At quarter past three, Rocky was suddenly busy, and you left the office. But you were unmindful of the downpour as you walked toward the corner drugstore in Carroll. You were also unmindful of a heavy truck parallel to you on the opposite side of the street. And in a moment, you were at the corner, and you stepped from the curb. <laughs> Stupid jerk! Oh, oh God, are you all right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Oh, that crazy driver! Why he might have killed you, Carol? That was no accident. What? What are you saying, Paul? Somebody wanted to kill me, and I've got a good idea who it was. Come on, let's get out of here. <laughs> Yes, Paul Reese. You had been marked for death. And you knew that it was Rocky who was responsible. You went to his office at once, but he was gone. Then you drove hurriedly with Carol to his home on Ardmore Drive. You left Carol in the car and walked with determined stride to the door and rang the bell. Paul. Yeah. Paul, you surprised? Uh, well, 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 what are you doing here? I just left you. Yeah, you just left me for dead. Two minutes after I stepped out of your office, a truck missed killing me by inches. Now, wait a minute, Reese. I had nothing to do with that truck. I swear it. You're a liar. Paul, I had nothing to do with that accident. Now, listen to no, me. No, you listen to me. I wasn't born yesterday, Rocky. When I learned about this deal and moved in, I knew there was one thing wrong with my plan. You could kill me or have it done. And you wouldn't have to make any split. Why would I wait so long? Because there was an extra five grand for you that way. The five grand I gave you this afternoon. But get this. I've covered myself, Rocky. What do you mean? Out of your reach, there's a letter which goes to my managing editor. In case of my death. A letter? What kind of a letter? Well, it's not a bread and butter note, Rocky. It's a detailed explanation of this whole dirty frame, and it names you. Understand? What? You. Hey, now, wait a minute. You're not trying to pull a fast double cross, are you? Don't be stupid. I want one thing, Rocky. I want money. Then you'll get it. Look, nothing has changed. Nothing at all. A messenger will be here at eight. Sooner if you want. With a fifty thousand, and you'll get your half in. The fight will come off at ten and Biff will lose. Tomorrow you get fifteen grand for the money you bet this afternoon. All right. That makes sense, Rocky. Just make sure it stays that way. Don't worry, Paul. It will. I swear it. <laughs> No, Paul. The arrangement would not be changed. You were pleased with yourself as you left Rocky's house and walked toward the car and Carol. But as you neared the automobile, a sudden wave of panic darted through you. Carol was gone. What? Carol! Carol! Paul! Paul, here I am. Oh, thank goodness. For a moment, I thought Rocky might... Where have you been? 
Oh, Mr. Fitzgerald is going to be at my house at 8 o'clock to pick up the $5,000. What? Well, I just talked to him on the phone. He discovered a mistake on the bank deposit slip after I left the office this morning. I told him that I was late in getting to the bank and took the money home. What did he say? Oh, he was glad, but of all the luck, he needs the money now. A shipment of furniture came in late this afternoon. But why did you call him? Oh, I got nervous thinking about the money, and I called my place. The boy at the desk said that Mr. Fitzgerald had been trying to reach me, so I called him. Oh, Paul, what are we going to do? If we don't get that money back, why, it means prison for both of us, Paul. Wait a minute. Sure. Sure, I've got it. We'll have the money there on time. Oh, how? Well, I'll go back to Rocky now, see? And I'll get him to move the delivery of the money up to 7 o'clock. That gives us an hour to get to your place. Oh, Paul, will it work all right? Yes, Carol. It'll work. I'm positive. <laughs> Yes, Paul, your plan would work. There was no doubt of that in your mind. And as you walked back to Rocky's door, a smile of self-satisfaction crossed your face as you thought once again of the wealth that would be yours in a matter of hours. But take heed, you who listen, lest you think that I, fate, am a conspirator in evil. An accomplice in crime. For in a few moments, I will write again in the record of Paul Rees. And when I have written, I will read from The Diary of Fate. Everything you had plotted and schemed for was only hours away, Paul. But as you walked back to the door of Rocky's house, another little thing happened. Your shoelace came untied, and you stopped to tie it. A moment later, you were going to ring the bell when you noticed the door was still ajar. You stepped into the house and were about to call out to Rocky when you heard his voice from the next room. No, 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 operator. I want Long Branch 3352. Yes, that's right, 3352. Hello. Hello, you... Is that you, Tony? Look, this is Rocky. Now, listen, the deal's off. Forget about the money. I'm in a jam and I can't go through with it, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll call you up if plans are changed. Okay. So long. Will you call me too, Rocky? What? Paul. Oh. What are you doing here? Oh, you dirty double-crosser. You can't call this thing off now. I've got to have that money. Paul, wait. Paul, you don't understand. Now, wait. I understand perfectly, you rat. No, no, Paul, you don't. You don't, Paul. Let me explain. Paul, put down that book in. Paul! Ah, uh, you filthy scum. Are you... Rocky. Rocky. Oh. Dead. Well, you had it coming to you. I think I still got time. Operator. Operator, I want Long Branch 3352. 3352? Yes. Uh, hurry up, please. Your number, please. Uh, my number, uh, it's, uh, uh, Walker, 7437. Hello, is this you, uh, Tony? Yeah, Mr. Pavier, who's this? Well, I'm calling for Rocky. Huh? Look, uh, the deal is on again, Tony. On again? <laughs> the price is same? Oh, sure, sure, the price is just the same. But uh, Rocky wants you to move the time up. Uh, make it just as soon as you can. Okay. Where do I deliver the goods? Well, there'll be a guy waiting for you at 711 North Ardmore. Oh, yeah, Tony, the right guy. You can give it to him. Yes, Paul Reese. In a matter of minutes, you will be dead. For as you wait calmly for what you think is a messenger with money, 
It is a messenger of death who approaches. The same man who tried to run you down with the truck. And now it is time to close the book. Another entry has been duly noted. And justice has been served. You see, I, fate, am but the instrument of a plan. And the trivia of life are the tools with which I work. Paul Reese forgot his pipe. A little thing. But as a result, he overheard a conversation which led him to a decision. And he chose for evil. And then because he stopped to tie his shoelace, another little thing, the precious seconds he consumed caused him to overhear and misunderstand another conversation which led him to death. Heed well the moral, you who listen and remember. There is a page for you in The Diary of Faith. The cast included Lois Andrews, Steve Brody, Herbert Litton, Jerry Hausner, Ivan Dittmars, Ray Erlenborn, and Hal Sawyer. This is a Larry Finley transcription, brought to you from Hollywood. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Wheaties presents Dimension X. Adventures in Time and Space. Transcribed in Future Tense. Dimension X. <laughs> On stage tonight, Dimension X. Another in the Wheaties' big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. Say, tomorrow's Saturday, you know, and maybe you don't have to show up for work. A whole swell summer day for just what you want to do. So, start off with a big holiday bowl of Wheaties at breakfast and just see how it sparks up the morning. Wheaties are whole wheat, you know, and I don't have to tell you what good, sturdy nourishment that is. So, if you've got fish to catch or golf to play or maybe a hike to take, just see how Wheaties can make it all a lot more fun. You know why? Why, lady, mister, it's just because you feel good. When you've had your Wheaties. Those two-fisted little whole wheat flakes are loaded with vitamins and minerals. And so are you. When you've had your Wheaties. 
Go on, try them. Just you see how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. When the first space rocket lands on Mars, what will we find? Will we be welcomed with open arms, or will the Martians treat us as invaders? Only one thing is certain. Someday a giant metal ship will take off from Earth to travel through the black velocities, the silent gulfs of space, to descend at last into the darkness of the upper Martian atmospheres. And on that day, man will finally know the answers. The day we first land on Mars. Now hear this. Now hear this. Approaching critical deceleration. Fasten gravity suits. Stand by the land. Mr. Lustig, what do you make of the terrain? There seems to be a heavy ground, Miss Captain. We won't be able to use our infrared lights. And we'll have to come in on radar. Well, isn't that a little risky, sir, landing in the dark? I'd rather run the danger of a blind landing lieutenant than come in without the cover of darkness. Remember, we don't know what kind of reception is waiting for us down there. Air speed 500. Altitude now 4,000. Bridge to engine room. Stand by for deceleration. Engine room. Aye. Fire forward tubes one and three. Aye. Skids down. Skids check. Altitude 500. Four. 350. Three. Up a point now. All right. Let's set her down. Look out! <laughs> Cut the power. Master's pipe battle stations. Hi, Sim. All secured, sir. Well, we're on Mars. April 20th, 1987. 4.33, Greenwich time. Enter that in the log, Master. I said... Well, gentlemen, it's less than two hours till dawn. As soon as it's light, we'll send out a landing party. Masters, get me an all-over hookup. All set, Captain. Now hear this. Now hear this. All right, men. The smoking lamp is lit. We're 17 men on an alien world. And it's up to us whether we ever get home again. Next few hours should tell the story... And I want instant obedience to all commands. I'll court-martial the first man who doesn't jump to when he's ordered. And one other thing. We may be on Mars, but this is still a United States naval vessel. Officers will conduct a personal and weapons inspection in one hour. And so. Inspection, Captain. How? Mr. Lustig, we've got an hour and a half to sweat out before we find out what's outside that airlock. I'd rather have a man worried about his stripes about what's waiting outside on Mars. Now hear this. Landing party report to forward airlock. Captain Black, Lieutenant Hingston, Lieutenant Lustig, and Dr. Horst report immediately to forward airlock. It is now landing time, minus five. Sounds like they're paging us, Hingston. You ready, Dr. Horst? Yes. Ready as I'll ever be. Oh, come on. Let's report to the airlock. Four minutes to go. Hey, where's the captain? Who knows? What difference does it make? Just want to get it over with, that's all. <coughs> Has anybody, uh... Get a cigarette. I think you're smoking too much, Lieutenant Lustig. Are you nervous? Lay off with your horse. Wondering what's hidden outside underneath that ground mist? Very unusual planet, Mars. Why? It has an atmosphere. Wonderful thing, an atmosphere. Where you find one, you find life. You mean Martians? What do you think they'll look like? Who knows? Intelligent life can take many forms. You mean they may have green skins and eyes on stalks or something? A comic book conception is possible. Or they may have developed to a point that is far beyond us. Perhaps they have a science that can produce weapons far more dangerous than our atomic missiles. You think we may have to fight our way out? After all, we are invaders. Now I hear this landing time minus two. Landing all time. All right, minus all right, two. we heard this. I know what I'd like to find outside that airlock. Good old Illinois. 
Ever been there, Lustig? Only Chicago. Oh, you ought to see my hometown. Green lawns, big white houses. Sounds like my hometown. My grandmother used to have one of those iron deers on the lawn. Every Halloween, we'd paint it another color. One time, we painted it black and white like a Holstein cow. <laughs> Where does your family live, Horst? I have no family. When I was a child, they were gassed to death in the Dachau concentration camp. That's tough. Oh, it has its advantages. I have no ties on Earth. Nothing to lose now. I imagine I'm the only one on board who is free to enjoy our present peculiar position. All right, Lustig. You can button it up now. Aye, sir. Now, gentlemen, in one minute we'll be the first men to set foot on Mars. Quite an honor, eh? As long as the medals are not awarded posthumously. Still uneasy, Dr. Horst? Captain Black, I've been uneasy ever since I can remember. On Earth and on Mars. Now, 30 seconds. Give me the intercom phone, Lusty. Masters? Aye, sir. Battle stations to be manned till we return. If we're not back in two hours, I want no rescue party sent out. Blast off and save the ship, you understand? Aye, sir. All right, gentlemen. Five seconds. Four. Three. Two. One. Lustig, open the outer airlock. Fresh air. Let's go. Hold it. It's too dark to move fast. Quiet, isn't it? Not even a wind. You can't see anything through this ground. Quiet. We don't know what's out here. Come on. What the... Quiet, Captain. I, I could swear that sounded like a rooster. I don't hear it anymore. A very unlikely sound. A rooster crowing on Mars? Kingston. Aye, sir. Set that machine gun 25 yards to the flank. We'll stay here till the ground mist lifts. Aye, aye, sir. What do you make of the ground, Horst? Grass. Plain grass. You can see some large foliage there where the mists thin down. What the heck is that? Kingston! Hold your fire, you fool! Some kind of wild animal. I hit it. I could see the tracers, but it's still standing. Come on, Horst. Doctor. Doctor, where are you? Up ahead. Admiring the wild animal. Careful, Horst. Wait for us. Don't worry, Captain. Huh. It's an iron deer. A lawn ornament. That's impossible. It's hollow. Interesting, isn't it? A whitewashed Victorian iron deer. Sitting on a lawn in the middle of Mars. I don't understand. Look around. The mist's lifting. The captain. Look there. A house, a regular old-fashioned house. On Mars. Good Lord. I haven't seen carved scrolls and gingerbread like that in years. Look at that port swing. The geraniums. There. I told you it was a rooster, Captain. Give me the glasses, Lustig. I want to take a look through that front window. There's an upright piano. Some sheet music on it. Lustig, it's beautiful Ohio. Beautiful Ohio? That can't be. Look here, Horace. Do you think that civilizations of two planets could be identical? I don't know. That specific variety of geraniums is only 50 years old on Earth. Is it logical they should develop in Mars? How about that port swing, that, that piano, and beautiful Ohio? No, it's impossible. Captain Black... This looks like the town I was born in. Well, it looks like my hometown, too. I've thought of something, sir. It's the only solution. Maybe we're not the first ship to reach Mars from Earth. That's the only answer. That's impossible, Lustig. There have been space travel that couldn't be secret. Do you have any idea what ships cost, what industrial power is needed? There's got to be some logical reason. Captain, I think perhaps we might find out. A light just went on in that house. Kingston, cover that door with the machine gun. Aye, aye, sir. Come on, horse. You ring that doorbell. There's got to be a scientific answer to all of this. There's something moving in there. Stand back, Horst. Give me a clear shot. Maybe a Martian. Captain, 
Can I help you? We... We were looking... Well, if you're selling anything, it's much too early. Uh, no, no, wait, wait a minute. What, uh, what town is it? What do you mean? Are you sent to stay to No, we're strangers here. We want to know how this town got here. Is this a game? No, no, it's not a game. We're from Earth. From where? From Earth. Do you mean out of the ground? The Earth. Uh... Are you sure you're feeling well? Madam, we came in a flying ship across space. We're from the third planet. This is this is Mars. Now do you understand? Mars. <laughs> you go away now, you hear? I'll call my husband from upstairs and he'll chase you now. But go on. This is Mars, isn't it? This is Green Lake, Wisconsin, in the United States of America. Bounded on the east by the Atlantic and on the west by the Pacific. Now 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 go away. Goodbye. <laughs> Of course, do you suppose it's really possible? I've got to find out more about this. For the last time, now go away. Pardon me, madam. What year is this? Year? Well, 1928, of course. Oh, for goodness sake. You hear that, Horst? And we know it's 1987. And we know it's Mars. Is it possible that we got fouled up? Made some tremendous blunder and circled around and landed back on Earth. In 1928? Maybe some switch in time or, or dimension. Could we have shifted somehow and gone backward in time? Horst, it won't hold water. It's not logical. We've checked every mile. We went past the moon and out into space. We're on Mars. Find out anything, Captain? No, we're going back to the ship till I figure out some logical explanation for all this. Lustig, out at point. Aye, sir. Hingston in the rear. Keep that gun in half, Lord. Aye, sir. Of course, there's got to be some cold, logical solution. Uh, yep. What? That house down the street. The white one with the green shutters. Lustig, what's the matter? I never thought. I never thought. Thank God. Thank God. Lustig. Lustig, come back here. He's running for the house. That crazy fool after him quick. Lustig, stop. Come down off of that porch. Grandpa. Grandpa. Lustig, what Grandma. the devil do you think you're crying? Grandma and Grandpa, it is you. Lustig, what's going on here? Albert, why, it's been so many years. How you've grown, boy. Oh, it's so good to see you. Lieutenant Lustig. Oh, oh, Captain. Uh, Grandma, I want you to meet my friend. This is Captain Black. Captain, oh. I want you to meet my grandfolks. Howdy. <laughs> Any friends of Albert is friends of ours. How long <laughs> you been here, Grandma? Oh, good many years. Ever since we died. Ever since you what? Oh, yes, sir. They've been dead 30 years. What? You mean to tell me that Mars is heaven? Oh, nonsense, no. All we know is here we're alive again. And who are we to question God's infinite ways? I, Lustig, we're going back to the ship. But, Captain, I want to talk to my grandfather. Lieutenant folks. Lustig, I don't like any part of this. You come back with us, I have to club you and carry you. Yeah, but, sir, there might... Heaven only knows what they've run up against back of the ship. Dimension X will continue in just a moment. Well, now let's come back to Earth for a moment. And what's more appropriate than Wheaties and baseball? You'll see what I mean as I introduce Ed Prentice, who has a special treat for you. Carry on, Mr. Prentice. Folks, I'd like to have you meet a good friend of mine and a prominent member of a fine little organization known as the Chicago White Sox, Mr. Lucius Benjamin Affleck. Ooh, Ed, don't say it like that. Who ever heard of a ball player named Lucius? What if I went around and called you Paul Edward Prenny? Let's just make it Ed and Luke, huh? <laughs> All right, Luke. Say, just how long have you been with the White Sox? Over 20 years, Ed. Golly, I've played in darn near 2,500 games. Then it bat almost 9,000 times. Man, I'm from way back. Well, Luke, you don't look it. How do you keep up the pace, anyway? Well, Ed, I sleep good. I eat good. I eat mighty good. Feed is about four mornings a week. Those little old flakes put a lot of snap, even in an old timer like me. Must be because they're 100% Whole wheat. I sure like Wheaties and milk and fruit. You know, Luke, that's exactly what I hear from a lot of ball players and plenty of other people, too. No wonder they call Wheaties the breakfast of champions. Well, thanks, Luke Appling and Ed Prentice. You know, folks, you may not be a champion ball player, but Wheaties can help you feel like one. So, triumph. Wheaties, that is. 
See how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Horst, look at that crowd around the ship. Looks like we're being welcomed with a celebration. Celebration? They've abandoned ship. Every port is open. No guards yet. You! You, masters! Hiya, Captain. Meet my old dad. Dad, that's Captain Black, and he's not a bad guy for an officer. Of all the... Kingston! Uh, oh, oh, what, sir? Bring that man back. Use force if you have to. Uh, I... Oh, excuse me, sir. There's my Uncle George. Kingston! I'll be right back, Captain. Uncle George! Uncle George! What the devil Don't is going... Understand, sir. They've all found friends and relatives. They're all here. He's right, Captain. I've counted. The whole crew's out in the crowd. But I gave orders. Definite orders. You don't understand, Captain. I understand Holy... mutiny. I don't care how many relatives show up. I'll have discipline on... Johnny! Johnny, you old son of a gun. Edward. Edward. It's you. It can't be. <laughs> of course it is. Johnny, you old son of a gun. Ed. Edward. Dr. Horst. This is my, my brother, Edward. How do you do? Hello. It's... It's wonderful to see you, Edward. Look, I, 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 I've got to get back to my hey, ship. Hey, I almost forgot. Mom's waiting at home. Mom? And Dad, too. Mom? Dad are alive? Excuse me, Horst. Then you're real, Ed. <laughs> Don't I feel real? How's that, huh? <laughs> Ed. Ed, right, we've, we've got lunch for you, Johnny. <laughs> Mom's making corn fritters. Corn fr Dr. Horst, haven't you found anybody? Uh, no, Captain. I have nobody. Well, then you come on home with me, right, Ed? Sure, you bet. Horst, you wouldn't believe it, but it's been 35 years since I had Mom's corn fritters. By George. 35 years. <laughs> And there's plenty more in the kitchen, so don't hold back, Johnny. You too, Dr. Horst. Well, Johnny, you're still in the Navy, huh? That's right, Dad. I'm in command of the ship. We're an old Navy family, Dr. Horst. All three of our boys in the service. Ed was the best pilot in the Pacific. What didn't happen, Ed? Oh, what's the difference? I'm here now. Oh, you know, it's almost perfect. All we're missing is your brother, Will. Then the whole family could be together. Well, it won't be long, Mom. Will's in charge of the XR-54. That's the next rocket coming out to Mars. Well, little Will. <laughs> when does he leave, Johnny? Takeoff scheduled for September, but it depends on what we report. <laughs> There's no question about that now, eh? Christmas together again. That'll be something, huh? Yes, sir. Well, this calls for celebration. How about a little of the old dandelion wine, eh, Johnny? Now, Father, don't you go giving Johnny too much wine. Oh, he's a big boy now, Mother. Oh, well, sir, isn't everything just fine? Just fine. Sure, what well, yeah. well, Dr. Horace, what do you think of my little family? Hmm? Very nice. You know, I can't understand why you didn't find any folks here, Dr. Horace. It's just a shame. Everybody else is so happy. I never remembered my family, Mrs. Black. All I know is they were gassed at Dachau during the Second World War. When I was liberated, I was in a delirium three months. I cannot remember anything before then. The psychiatric phenomenon. That's terrible. Isn't there anything anybody can do? I don't want to remember. Oh. I haven't had a pleasant life. I prefer to be free of emotional entanglements. They interfere with a scientific approach. I'm sorry, Dr. Horst. Oh, I'll get it. Hey, that's our ring, long and three shorts. Oh. I remember that. Well, maybe we'd oh. better call it a night. 
You must be getting tired, Johnny. I'd better be going back to the ship. Oh, nonsense. You stay the night. We insist. I just couldn't rest thinking of you all alone on that ship. I'd be all right. Well, good night. Wait a minute, Dr. Horst. That phone message was for you. Me? Yeah, that's right. A message from Anna. Anna? I don't remember any Anna. She asked if you were better. Well, perhaps she's someone you knew at Dachau. Anna? She said she's coming over here first thing in the morning. So you'll have to stay over. Yes, Well, that but... settles it then. You stay here, Horst. You can bunk with me in my old room. Oh, but Johnny... We thought you'd like to be with Edward. So you could talk the way you used to. Well, we can't put Dr. Horst on the day bed. I think we'd better share the room tonight. There'll be plenty of time for talking, Ed. I guess so. Well, I suppose I'd better drop back to the ship. You know, Ed, security check. Well, why do you have to do that here? Well, I don't know. There's no good reason, I guess. <laughs> well, I suppose we skip it tonight. Oh, oh sure. sure. Uh, good night, everybody. <laughs> oh, it's good to have you home, Johnny. It's good to be home, Mom. Captain Black, are you asleep? No, no. I just been thinking about what we were expecting. <laughs> Green-skinned Martians with eyes on stalks. All the time, it was only Mom and Dad and Edward waiting. Oh, it's funny what tricks your imagination can play on you. Yeah, I guess Mars is heaven, Horst. Hmm. I've been thinking about Martians, too. Yeah. <sighs> Captain, just suppose... Suppose there were Martians, and they saw us land. Suppose they thought of us as invaders... What would be the best weapon they could use against our atom bombs? I don't see what you're getting at. They would want to disarm us first. Hmm. To wipe out all suspicion. To make us feel at home. Hmm. But suppose this house isn't real. Suppose the people are just images. Stolen from our own memories. By Martians. Created for us by telepathy. Hypnotism. <laughs> That's the craziest theory I ever heard. Maybe that's why there was no one for me. Yeah. Because in all my life, there is no happy memory. No real love person. Well, how about that phone call from Anna? Yes. Anna. I don't remember who she was, but I do now. I just remembered. When I was freed from Dachau, sick and delirious, I raved about a wonderful, kind nurse named Anna that took care oh, of me. There you are. It's logical. She's coming to see you tomorrow. But there was no Anna. I'd be nursed by a man. What? Anna... It was only a dream. And there's only one way they could have learned about her. By reading my subconscious mind. But that's impossible, Horst. Why? The whole crew was thinking of home. Suppose the Martians read our minds. Yes, but if, if there are Martians... If there are, they have us separated. Each man in a different house. Sleeping. Trusting. No one at the guns. I left my pistol downstairs. Do you, do you think there's something to this, Horst? It's a who would suspect his own mother, his grandparents. How easy. Just a knife in the heart of each sleeping man. It's impossible, Horace, but we've, we've got to get back to the ship. Listen. The crickets have stopped. Come on. We don't know when they change back to them. Whatever they really are. Where are you going, John? Ed, well, we we wanted to drink of water. That's all, Ed. You're not thirsty, John. You don't want to drink. You don't want to drink. His face, it's changing. And his hands, he's a Martian. Run, horse. Run. Get away, John. You can't get away. This way, horse. Horse, where are you? Can you hear me, Earth? This is Captain John Black, the XR-53, calling from Mars. I've locked myself in the ship, but they've crippled it. I, I can't take off or fire the guns, and they're coming for me now, the Martians. 
I'm all alone here. All the rest are dead. Hanks and Lustig. Dr. Horst. Poor Horst. He didn't even reach the door. Listen. Listen. They're trying to break through the hall now. Edward and Mom and Dad and all the folks. But they're changing now. Melting and changing back into... They're Martians. Can you understand me? Martians, not men. They made us think that Mars was heaven. We fell into the trap. Can you hear me, Earth? You've got to stop the next rocket. Tell, tell my brother Will. Tell my brother Will not to come. They'll trap him too. They'll kill them all. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me, Earth? This is John Black on Mars. Hello, Earth. This is John Black on Mars. Tonight, Dimension X has presented and transcribed the Ray Bradbury story, Mars is Heaven, adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured players were Wendell Holmes as Captain Black and Peter Capel as Dr. Horse. Your narrator, Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman. Engineer, Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Robert Warren speaking. In a moment, we'll tell you about next week's show. And now, here is your Wheaties man, Frank Martin. Folks, tonight we have a special guest for you. Here he is, Joel McRae. Hello, Frank Martin. I kind of expected to see a package of Wheaties sticking out of your pocket. Why, well, did I forget them? You must like <laughs> Wheaties, Frank. Sure, don't you? You bet. I'm joining the big parade of Wheaties programs, you know, with Tales of the Texas Rangers come Saturday night. Well, that promises to be real entertainment, Joel. I understand these are true stories of the Texas Rangers. Absolutely. Each story is straight from the Texas Ranger files. Well, we're mighty proud to have you join us, Joel, with this new program. We'll all be listening on the same NBC station Saturday night for Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Okay, Mr. McRae? Okay, partner. Good night. Good night, Joel. And friends, be sure to listen Saturday, that's tomorrow night, to Joel McRae and his new program, Tales of the Texas Rangers. And get your Wheaties, everybody. <laughs> And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you again to listen tomorrow night to Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. Next week, the story of the strangest case ever recorded in the files of the Bureau of Missing Persons. The case of The Man in the Moon. You'll hear the whole story next week when we venture once more into the unknown world of... Dimension X. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. comes Monk Mayfair, the ape like chemist. Gracious! Ham Brooks, the sword-wielding lawyer. Take that! 
Rennie Renwick, the two-fisted engineer. Holy cow! Long Tom Roberts, the adventurous electrical genius. Pipe down, you guys. Johnny Littlejohn, the fighting archaeologist. I'll be super amalgamated. And their leader, the greatest adventure hero of the 1930s, the Man of Bronze, Doc Savage. The Variety Arts Radio Theater, by special arrangement with Condé Nast Publications, presents The Adventures of Doc Savage, a new series of radio adventures based on the novels by Lester Dent. Today, The Mysterious Weeds, Chapter 6 of the fantastic story, Fear Key. Doc Savage and his crew have trailed the Fountain of Youth gang to Fear Key, a remote island in the Caribbean, trying to discover the fabulous secret material the gang is attempting to steal from old Dan Thunden. As Doc and Kel Avery attempt to learn about the island's horrible presence that turns men into skeletons, they are captured by Santini, the leader of the gang. Meanwhile, Rennie, Johnny, and Long Tom rescued Doc's cousin Pat Savage from Santini's guards and then follow old Dan Thunden into the jungle in hopes of discovering the whereabouts of Doc and Kel Avery. Thunden leads them to a secret trap door in the rocks and is tricked by Rennie into opening the trap himself. But just as the door springs upward, Dan Thunden collapses on the rocks. He's passing out, falling down right by the trap door. Oh, my God. He looks dead. Why, he isn't dead. He's just sleeping. He's been knocked out. Rennie, what do you do? Look around the edge of the trap door, Pat. Particles of glass, like a small light bulb had broken. Ah, Doc's anesthetic bulb? Right, Long Tom. When I was bending down pretending to examine the trap door, I put some of it around the edge of the slab. When the lid opened, they broke. And since the gas produces instant unconsciousness, Thunden passed out before he had a chance to escape back into the jungle. (laughs) So the old goat wasn't so wise after all. Boy, when he wakes up, will his face be red. Hey, what's going on out there? Quick, Rennie, pretend you're one of the gang. Uh, we got old Dan Thunden. Come up and have a look. Yeah? Uh, who are you? Tell him Snicker. Guess the name of one of the gang who was watching me. Uh, Snicker! Get down here where I can get a look at you. I gotta be sure it's you, Snicker. Uh, we gotta do something. He'll get suspicious pretty soon. Wait, I've got some anesthetic bulbs left. I'll lob them down into the holes. Yeah, okay. Here I come. That's it. Come on. Take his machine gun, ready, And then I'm all set. What impends now? Now, This is no place for you, Johnny. The going will be too rough for those banged-up ribs of yours. That is regrettably true. You better stick here on guard. You can watch Thunder and the other guy. They'll be unconscious for at least an hour. But I'll stay here. Sure you won't pass out? Positive. Okay. Keep your super machine pistol handy. You never know when one of Santini's mob may show up. Indeed. And I have a pocket full of anesthetic bulbs also. Okay. Rennie, Pat, let's go. Something on this key that can turn a man into a skeleton. Whatever the thing is, Santini and his men are in deadly fear of it. Uh, we know, Pat. We've seen a sample of its work on the flyer who brought Dan Thunden here. What's that? I don't know. Sounds like bacon fried. Doesn't seem to be coming any closer. Let's keep going. Long Tom? What are you wiping on the walls? One of Doc's chemical mixtures. I don't see anything. It's invisible unless subjected to ultraviolet light. I've got a flashlight similar to Rennie's, except that it gives off black light. It'll make the stuff glow so we can find our way back if necessary. And in a hurry if necessary. Hold it. Get that. Wait. And look. 
Quiet! Just that flashlight, right? Ready? Come on. Quietly. Holy God. Look. Doc. And there's Cal Avery. So they did get him after all. Wow. They've got Doc tied up with so much rope. He looks like a mummy. And they're really staying away from him. Guess they're not taking any chances. Shh. Here comes Santini. Listen. Probably wondering why we did not shoot you when we had the chance in your savage. You were kept alive to do a bit of a work for us. And if you do it well, we will permit you to live. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> there is a something on this island which is worth many millions of dollars, Senor Savage. It grows here. But we do not know what it looks like when it grows. We've only seen it after it has been dried and treated. This material is, a, is a hidden somewhere. And only Danaconda knows of the hiding place. And he won't tell you. Unfortunately, no. When we visited this island the first time, we learned of this thing. And arranged with a thunder to sell it to those who could afford to pay us millions of dollars for it. We went to New York and made a contact with a number of wealthy men. The names and the files of the fountain of youth offer. Exactly, Senor Savage. Well, they were very anxious to buy what we had to sell and to pay a handsome price. It was then that we had decided to get rid of that thunder. That may have been a mistake. He found out our intentions and seized the box containing our entire supply of this fabulously valuable substance. Yes? Uh, the older man had a very little of money, but he hit on the idea of persuading a relative, uh, a Miss Avery here, to finance him in a selling the material. He sent the box to Miss Avery and arranged a rendezvous in Florida, which we were fortunate enough to prevent him from keeping. So you tried to kidnap the girl and get the box, but you failed and she became alarmed. She decided to call upon me for aid. You tried to seize me before she got to New York. An accurate summation. Now, for our proposition, we want your aid. We will trade the safety of you and your party, including Miss Avery, for your help. And how do you suppose I can help you, Santini? I know something of your ability. You will notice that we keep our flashlights off of your eyes. This is because we know you are a skilled hypnotist. You can hypnotize Ten Thousand and make him tell where this, uh, shall we say, treasure uh, is hidden. Hmm? But you haven't got Ten Thousand. Oh, we will get him. Leaking, shorty, go get the tunnel. No, right, boss. Holy cow! They're coming this way. Hey, it's more savages' crew. See you there. We gotta make a fight of it, guys. We got him going. Hey, what's that Dini doing? He's pulling back. Look out! It's a trap, a net. Holy cow! It's got us up against the wall. We shoot somebody, ready? It's no good. They've got us. Knocking them out, man. Oh. No. They're out, boys. Wait. Now, quick. Go see if they left the car at the entrance. Johnny, what are you doing here? Hey, I'm Monk. I couldn't proceed with my damaged ribcage, so they left me on guard. What's going on? We heard shooting. I know, Monk. I heard it, too, in the labyrinthine spaces beneath here. You mean the island has caves underneath it? Yes, Ham. Santini and his cohorts are occupying them, running along Tom and Pat are exploring, trying to find Doc and Kel Avery. Pat! You mean you found it? Indubitably. But you say they got Doc. Undeniably. What happened to Thunder here? Uh, Rennie rendered him unconscious with one of Doc's anesthetic bulbs. Say, where's the Klima? Back in the plane. Hey, listen. Somebody's coming this way through the cave. Maybe it's Rennie. Maybe Santini and his gang. There. There they are. It is. There. Let them have it. Let's get out of here. Johnny. Not without assistance. I'll carry it. Come on. They gave up the chase. Conjecture that once they gained possession of Dan Funden, their interest in us waned. And let's stop for a minute. Even as thin as you are, Johnny, you're still a low to haul. You sure came out on the short end of that bit of gunplay, you hairy ape. Shyster, if you throw away that sword cane and use a gun, we'd have better luck. 
How could I find anybody to shoot at? And they're always charging into the fray. Never mind. Now, Johnny, what's been going on? Hey, Johnny, you all right? Well, I'll be super amalgamated. What you doing down on the ground? Look at this. It's just a funny-looking weed. Weed. Neither of you ever saw flora of this type before. So what? Monk, Ham, I invite you to examine the confines of this area of vegetation. Huh? He said, look around this patch of green. Somebody's garden patch. I suspect it's far more than that. I think I'll take some of these weeds for future study. They're very strange. Not half as strange as some of the other things on this island. For instance, what is it that's making people into skeletons? And what's Santinia? Good question. Yeah. And we won't find the answer in this patch of crabgrass. Let's get back to the plane. <laughs> Here's the plane. Pam, I thought you indicated that the Klima was awaiting us here. He was. The Klima! Laces. He had orders to stick right here. Something's happened. Well, I'll be super amalgamated. Look over here. The Klima! Yo! Look at that knot on his noggin. Someone really slugged him a good one, all right. Uh, He's coming out of it. The Klima, what happened? Oh, for you, fella, I stand around and listen. Yes. And then all of a sudden... The top of my head should go bang like a firecracker on the 4th of July. Then what? How do I know? The world should kind of uh, stop for to go around there. <laughs> Somebody sneaked up behind and kissed your bean with a gun barrel or something, huh? Maybe. I know see the soul. Not a soul. But show me the damn fellow would do this to the Klima, and I tear from him the arm and leg. <laughs> you sure do talk, big boy. But in action, you ain't been so hot. Uh, what do you mean by that? The insult, no. Don't mind the missing leg to clean me. He fell out of his nest when he was little. <laughs> I might have known this fella. He born in a nest in a tree, like the monkey. <laughs> Stop it. This is no time for character assassination. What are we going to do now? Take the plane and try to spot Santini's men. Right. Come on. Wait a minute, fellas. What is it? We ain't going nowhere. Why not? Because if you'll take a gander at the motors of the plane, you may notice that the carburetors are missing. So that's what Santini's men came here for. Well, now what? Well, obviously, the wisest course is to return to the rocky area. What then? I haven't an inkling. But if Santini and his henchmen took the vital parts of our motors, they no doubt removed them to the caverns. Makes sense. Okay, we'll pack some equipment and head for the rocky area. Uh, may I suggest that we traverse the slightly circuitous route via the beach? It would be easier, particularly considering the condition of my rib cage. I'm not equal to much more junk. Good idea, Johnny. It'll probably be faster going anyway. Okay, let's pack up and head out. <laughs> Here Not a great deal, De Klima. Boy, Shyster, are you going to suffer for that crack about me falling out of the nest? Listen, you refugee from a monkey. I house. say, I... look. Where? There. Adjacent to that outgrowth of jungle. You see, bits of timber sticking out of the sand. Just an old wrecked ship. Not quite, Monk. I want to investigate. It's the frame of a ship. Not a large vessel. Once carved in elaborate fashion. What are we killing time here for? It's just a weather-beaten old hulk. Did you ever see a Roman galley, monk? Blazes, no. I'm not 2,000 years old. Well, this was once a Roman galley. I'm sure of it. Roman galley? How did it get here on this side of the Atlantic? Drifted, perhaps. Nix. Ocean currents are wrong for that. And possibly it had sails which were set, and the wind blew it across. It's not impossible. And may be correct. This key is on the outskirts of the Caribbean. A craft blown across the Atlantic might conceivably have landed here, or been wrecked. As this one undoubtedly was. Okay, so it came across the Atlantic and filed up here. I don't see why all the excitement. I have an astounding theory. But perhaps we should go into that later. Yeah, we still have Doc, Kel, Avery, and the others to worry about. And that rocky area is just inland from here. Shall we hit the jungle? Right. It's going to be hard to get close to that trap door without being hurt. Yes, but we must. It's just beyond this growth of mangroves. Hold it. Let me take a gander with the telescope before we barge in there. 
Hmm. No sign of life. No sign of any trap doors. Looks like one solid mass of rock. Johnny, can you find any of the trap doors? I don't know, Ham. I can try. Come on, then. Keep your super machine pistols ready. Don't hear nothing. That could be good or good. Hey! I, me, I find the hole. I hit it with the hand. Hey, pal. Shake. What hole? You finally performed a useful sight. Uh, well, do we enter? I'll say. Get us your flashlight and follow me. Nice place, this. Pipe down. Look! There! Why, is the cleaver? You want to bust our ears off? A man, I see him. Him to see me. That guy Santini, I think it was. Well, if it was, it's going to be tough from now on. I think I have an idea. Yes, I said what? Let's use the light spot cartridges. Say, you are bright. What's that? A light spot cartridges? It's a special shell doc came up with. a fit in our super machine pistols. They burn with a brilliant white light whenever they strike. An intricate mixture of thermite and magnesium. Let's alternate light spot cartridges with mercy bullets. Five of each. An effective combination. Loaded. Indeed. Okay, let's go. Look! Some of Santini's men. Let him have the spot! Blaze! Something's wrong! These ammo guns are dead! When those birds got into the plane, they must have ducked at the bullets! Roger them! There's too many of them! That's the way we came! The claimer! Retreat! Say it! Run! He's not moving! Seize them! Seize them! I'm paralyzed. You ought to be, you missing link. But you're just tied up like the rest of us. Shyster. Boy, <laughs> that ain't got you roped. No more than Doc. Look. Yeah, nothing short but your head and feet, Doc. They don't take many chances, do they? Are you all right? I've always said Monk's skull was thick. Everybody else is here, too. Johnny, Long Tom, Rennie. In fact, Kel Avery and the Gleamers. Hey, they even got old Dan Thunder. He's still out from the effect of the antithetic gas. Well, what now? I think the answer to that is coming in right now. Well, well. It is in the big reunion, eh, senores? <laughs> in your hat, Santini. Oh, this is a joyful occasion for me. This is what I wait for. Not only do I have the fabulous Doc Savage a prisoner, so he will not interfere with my search for the weeds, but I also have the old Dan Thunder who can tell me where the weeds are. If he ever does. Oh, he will, senor. That I can guarantee you. Take the old man to somewhere and make him answer a question. You're right, boss. Perhaps it is also best to separate the rest of you so you do not applaud anything to foil our plans. Take Savage and every girl to another king, but be sure not to go near that door with the secret lock. We do not want our friends here to turn into skeletons. At least, not yet. <laughs> Has Doc finally met his match in the evil Santini? Will Dan Thunden reveal the whereabouts of the secret cache of the valuable weeds? And what will happen when Santini exposes Doc and his crew to the mysterious power that turns men to skeletons? Don't miss The Crawling Terror, the seventh and final chapter of Fear Key, next time on The Adventures of Doc Savage. <laughs> Fear Key was written by Lester Dent and adapted for radio by Roger Rittner. Featured in the cast were Daniel Chodos, Robert Towers, Art Dutch, Bill Ratner, Kimmet Muston, Scott McKenna, Robin Riker, Bob Farley, and Michael McConaughey. Also heard were Douglas Kohler and Bob Lyon. 
The sound effects were created by David Surtees, assisted by Jerry Williams. Production assistance by Samantha Kimmel and Doris Christie. Engineering by Denny King. Adventures of Doc Savage is produced and directed by Roger Rick and is a presentation of the Variety Arts Radio Theater. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Adam Hack presents... Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Say, what's the matter? Surely you're not nervous. Perhaps it will calm you if I tell you a story. It's a rather odd story. About a rather odd individual. You see, he was a morgue keeper. I call his story The Man Who Talks With Death. My story, The Man Who Talked With Death, begins in the city morgue on a raw autumn evening. Two men have just entered the badly lighted basement of the gloomy stone building. I don't know whether it's cold in here or outside. Yeah, where's Pop Hanson? I want to get my pictures and get out of here. The place gives me the creep. All Pop's around someplace. He probably... Hey, isn't that him? He talked to somebody down there by the ice boxes so they keep us stiff? Yeah. Why, there's nobody there. Pop's talking to himself. Unless he's talking to a ghost. Come on. Yes, you know, there is some place else you go on to, but it's not a place you have to be frightened or believe me. Now it's time for you to go. Goodbye, Jean. Goodbye. Hey, Pop. Oh, hello, boys. I didn't hear you come in. Hmm. Hey, Pop, who are you just talking to? Oh, that was Jean Williams. She came in last night. What do you mean, she came in last night? I mean, her body was brought in. Here, I, I sure know. There she is, so young and so pretty. No wonder she was frightened when she found she was dead. You say you were talking to her? Why, yes, Harry. You see, when you die, a part of you goes on to someplace else. But it always stays near its body for a while till it gets used to things. 
It was that Gene Williams I was just talking to, of course. Pop, you've been working down here among these steps too long. You mean I just imagine I talk to them and they talk to me? <laughs> no, Tom. It's really true. Someday you'll know I'm telling the truth. Well, maybe. Let's stand the chatter. I want to get the picture of John Wainwright. Wainwright? Oh, yes, they brought him in last night. Everybody who dies a violent death comes here for old Pop to talk to him. Yeah, here he is. Okay, Harry, get yourself a couple of pictures and we'll be gone. Yeah, I won't take a minute. I sure would like to know who killed Wainwright. The killer didn't leave a clue. Why, if it's that young Professor Higgins who shot Wainwright, Tom? Higgins? The pride and joy of the city university? How'd you know? Wainwright told me so himself. Wainwright told you? What are you giving me? It's true. You see, he was a blackmailer and he was blackmailing Higgins' wife. Professor Higgins had to kill him to save her. Wainwright told me so just before he left a little while ago. But Wainwright's dead. There's his body right there in the iPod. I know. I explained about that. Oh, you're crazy. But I'm not, Tom. Wainwright even told me that the gun Professor Higgins used is hidden now in the left-hand bottom drawer of the professor's desk in his home out at the university. Okay, Tom, let's scram now. Just a second. Pop, I don't know where you got your tip, but I'm going to look into this. Oh, no. You mustn't. You see, Tom, the things that the dead tell me, they can't be used in any way by the living. It's too dangerous to the living. They just can't be used. Well, this can if it's true. If Higgins killed Wainwright, and I can prove it, boy, what a story it'll make. No, Tom, you mustn't try to prove it. It'll do you no good. Try and stop me. Come on, Harry. Thanks very much, Dean. Goodbye. There you are, gentlemen. You've just talked to the Dean himself on the phone, and he's told you I was playing cards at his home at 11 o'clock last night. Will that satisfy you? Yes, Professor Higgins. Wayne Rutt. Wayne Wright was shot at 11, so the alibi lets you out. Well, who in the world ever suggested that it was I who shot Mr. Wainwright? <laughs> Nobody in the world, Professor. It was a ghost. Wainwright, ghost. I'm afraid I don't understand. Oh, it's just a gag, Professor. Thanks. Come on, Harry. Let's get back to town. I told you the whole thing was a wild goose chase. You don't mean you really believe that crazy stuff Pop told us about talking to Wainwright's ghost? No, of course not. But I thought maybe Pop knew something and was trying to give us a tip without admitting it. Say, wait a bit, huh? What is it? Higgins is a smart guy. Maybe that alibi was fake. Oh, no, Tom. Pop said the murder gun was hidden in Higgins' desk. I think we ought to go back and search that desk. Oh, but that's crazy. Hey. Hey, Tom, what are you doing? Just putting on the brakes. I'm going to turn around and go back. Yeah, but the road's all wet here. Hey, Tom, we're kidding. I'll get us out of it. Yeah, there's a hundred foot drop into the gully there. Here we go. Yeah, Tom, we're going over it. Jump, Tom. <laughs> While my goose pimples go away, and we all wait to learn what happens next, I'd uh, like to ask Dr. Weir a question. Yes, yes, young man. I'm all ears. Oh, well, point them the other way, please. And answer me this. One of our listeners wants to know why you're on the air only 15 minutes instead of a half hour. If we can scare people half to death in 15 minutes, well, I take twice as long. <laughs> Very logical, Doctor. The Adam Hat people use similar logic in their business. Take the famous Adam 5, just for instance. Their feeling is, if we can deliver real hat quality for $5, why charge twice as much? And go on with Adam hats in every price range. Every Adam hat might well sell for more. Master craftsmen design every Adam style. Up to the minute in fashion, correct in the best of good taste. Stroll into the nearest Adam hat store and look around a bit. Try on a few that strike your fancy. You'll find perfect fit, perfect style, and perfect price. And Adam does something for a man. Now, Dr. Weir. Now I'll continue my story of the man who talked with death. It's a few moments after the crash, and Tom and Harry are picking themselves off the ground 
on the very edge of the deep gully into which their car is just flying. Hi. Hi, where are you? Over here. I'm oh, just making sure I'm still on one pace. Oh, uh, you. I'm all right, I guess. It's a miracle. We weren't both killed. Look at the car down there. Hold it up like an accordion. Yeah, I got the car door open. I thought we were going over and must have both been thrown clear. Now what are we going to do? We're going back to the university. And we're going to get into Higgins' office and see if the murder gun is really there in his desk. Uh, Pop was just talking nonsense when he said we'd find it there, Tom. Maybe and maybe not. I don't believe in his little conversations with ghosts, but I do believe he knows something. And if he does, I'm going to crack this case. <laughs> time later, Tom and Harry reached Professor Higgins' residence again and gained entrance to his office unseen through an open window. Okay, this is that. Which door did Pop say? On the bottom left-hand one. This is one. It's open. And there is a gun here. Look. Yeah. 45 automatic. And Pop was right. You bet he was. He was also right when he said Professor Higgins shot Wainwright. Higgins faked the alibi. Here, I'll get the gun out. No, don't touch it. The cop will have to find the gun here in this desk to be convinced it really belongs to Higgins. Yeah, of course. Then let's call him and get him out here. No, no, not yet. We're going back to the morgue and ask Pop a few questions. Back to the morgue. And Tom, listen. Do you suppose Wainwright really could have told Pop all this after he was dead? Of course not. That stuff of talking to the stiff is a lot of malarkey. Pop knows something and he's hiding it. We're going to find out what he knows and how, and then we're going to break the biggest story this town has ever seen. Slipping away in the darkness, Tom and Harry tried vainly to summarize back to the city. In the end, they had to walk the whole distance. And it was well after midnight when they once more stood outside the cold, gray morgue building. Oh, what a night. I never walked so far in my life. Why do you suppose those drivers wouldn't stop and give us a lift? I don't know. I guess they're afraid of a stick-up. Well, let's get inside and give Pop the old third degree. Yeah, I wish we didn't have to. I hate to go in there again, Tom. This place upset me. Oh, come on. We're the lucky ones. We can walk out again. Hey, somebody's left the door open. Come on in. Tom. Tom, I'm frightened. I don't want to go in there where they keep the bodies. I, I just don't want to. Oh, you're acting like a kid. Now, come on. There's Pop over there by the ice boxes. Oh, Pop! Oh, hello, boys. I've been kind of expecting to see you too. Pop, we want to ask you some questions. Tom, you went out to talk to Professor Higgins, didn't you? And I asked him not to. I told you it wouldn't do you any good, not any good at all. Oh, but it did. We found the gun just where you said it to be. Boy, what a story this town's going to read tomorrow morning. No, they'll never read it. The Wainwright shooting is never going to be cleared up. It's always going to be a mystery. It has to be that way. Uh, Pop, how do you know about Higgins and that gun? Don't you realize yet I was telling you the truth? That Wainwright himself told me after they brought his body here? Tom, I think Pop's telling the truth. Well, you may be crazy, but I'm not. Now, Pop, come clean. I should never have told you, Tom. That caused all your trouble. I'm sorry, Tom. I'm awful sorry, but I warned you not to go, remember? If you hadn't, it would never have happened. What are you talking about? What would never have happened? Ah, I think I know what Pop means. I think I know. Sure you do, Harry. Tom will understand in a minute, too. Look, Tom. Look here. Uh, two bodies sadly smashed up. Well, so what, huh? Don't you know now? It's true. Pop really can talk to the dead. He really can. That's why you can talk to us. Harry, get a hold of yourself. What's the matter with Tom? Those two bodies... They're ours. We're both dead. We were killed when our car crashed into the ravine. So Pop could talk to the dead after all. At least Tom and Harry found the proof very convincing. But if you find it hard to believe... Why not drop in at the morgue and see for yourself? Of course, you'd have to go there as a dead body. But we could easily arrange that. And, oh, you're leaving now. Well, perhaps you'll drop in again soon. I'm always home. Just 
look for a house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. When Mike left his latest trucking student at the terminal, he knew that Dave was not truly gone. The smell would take a lot longer to get out of his truck's cabin. What Mike didn't know, though, is that the odor wasn't the only thing that Dave left behind. Bedbugs by Jason R. Davis, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. silent herald of life and death, success or failure, the unseen force that measures man's destiny, reaching its most fateful moment as it slowly strikes the eleventh hour. Sorry, Helen. What was it? Surely this isn't why you brought me to dinner. To ignore me. Helen, I... You've been staring off into space ever since we got here. Can't you tell me what's bothering you? I've been trying to. I thought it would be easier to say here. After all, we met in the shows and... Well, go on. And we say goodbye at the shows. I see. Just like that? I'm taking the midnight plane from London Airport. To where? Paris. Paris. May I have a cigarette? Of course. Thank you. Am I allowed to ask why? You won't like the answer. Helen, I'm sorry. I thought, well, it seemed much kinder somehow to tell you in the place where we've... where we... <sighs> where we fell in love. It's not hard to say. Not if you really want to say it. All right, Helen, you've asked for it and I'll tell you. Let me introduce you to the genuine Max Jellard. I know him. Oh, no, you never met him. He depends on people like you, Helen. The girls with attractive fortunes. Max. Why do you think I came to your table that night? I knew darn well you were Helen Morgan, that your father, Sir Michael, managed the Morgan Trust that would eventually be yours. Half a million pounds sterling. I see. Oh, there's a lot more. I knew that if I could play my cards properly, it'd be good for 20 or 30,000. But your father would pay that much to prevent even the suspicion of a scandal. Blackmail. Exactly. I was even rather proud of my record up to that time. More than a dozen neat precincts and never a brush with the police. I think I'd better be going. You might let me finish my confession. Oh, I've been questioned once or twice, but never convicted. Fingerprinted once, but that's all. And then three months ago, I came in here. And you were here. I asked you to dance. And as we danced, I was mentally calculating how long it would take me. How long did you give me? A month. That was three months ago. That month went by and I couldn't face the thought of not seeing you. Second month, I kept telling myself not to be a fool that Helen Morgan was just another bankrupt. Let me come to now. Is that why you couldn't tell me? Because you didn't want to think it was true? I love you, Helen. Goodbye. <laughs> Helen, turn this thing around and drop me at the airport. How can you know what my father thinks of a marriage between us until you've asked him? If you love me enough to leave me, surely you can bring yourself to beard father in his den. He's not exactly an ogre. Oh, I should have known you'd pull off some stunt like this when you followed me out of Michelle's. I should have cleared off to Paris without telling you. Max, I'll turn around. If that's what you really want. Keep driving, Helen. At least you'll find out there's no chance for us.
And uh, another thing, Gerard, I've been wondering when Helen would decide to bring you home. Cigar. No, thanks, sir. Well, they're very good, I assure you. I have them brought over from Jamaica. No, thanks. Ah. I must admit I thought you'd have come to me earlier than this, so help yourself to drink. Sir Michael, I... I... Usually doesn't take this long, I'm informed. You must be slowing up, Gerard, getting rusty in your technique, perhaps. Ah, that's got it. Well, how much do you want? Father... Be quiet, Helen. That is what you came for, isn't it? Well, isn't it, Gerard? I suppose you have a letter that Helen's written to you, something I'll need to buy back. You've known about me all along. My dear fellow, I can afford to allow Helen to indulge herself on occasion. If she chooses to do that with a cunning, contemptible, blackmailing crook, I can even afford that. Now, will you have that drink? I think I'd better. Father, please, you've got Whiskey, to Whiskey, Thank you. Don't, Helen, leave this to me. You uh, don't want me to pollute this stuff with soda, I hope. No? Good. <laughs> One thing puzzles me, Gerard. Why did you come here with Helen? Is that usual? Cheers. Good health. If you've quite finished, Sir Michael, I'd like to tell you why I'm here tonight. You were right, Max. It's no good talking to him. I was stupid enough to want to believe that there might be a chance for Helen and me. And don't think she doesn't know about me. I told her everything tonight. And when I left her, I was on my way to pick up my plane ticket for Paris. Did you say a chance? A chance for what? To be married. Now, listen, Gerard, I... Get out! Get out before I have you thrown out! And be on that plane, Gerard. If you ever set foot in England again, I'll have you arrested on sight if I have to part with my entire fortune to fix you. We'd better go, Max. You're not going anywhere, Helen. You are not to see this... this criminal again. I'm going to marry him, Father. You can't stop me. So... That's it. No blackmail, eh? I should have given you more credit in the first place. You're cleverer than I thought, Gerard. My reports weren't thorough enough. All right. How much to buy you off? What is the current price for husbands? Not a cent, Sir Michael. Goodbye, Helen. I'm coming with you. All right, Gerard. You can increase your price now. I'm threatening you with a gun. That ought to cost me a few extra thousand. Father, please. Keep back, Helen. Give me that gun. No. <laughs> Helen, don't be a fool. Do you think I want to harm you, Helen? It's this black... <laughs> Stop it, you hear? Stop it. I feel in my own father. You hit me. You hit me. Darling, I'm sorry, but you've got to listen to me. It was an accident. You were both holding the gun, fighting for it. It might just as easily have been you that got shot. Oh, Max. What do we do? I'm going to call the police. <laughs> no, not the police. Got a better idea. Helen, take the car. You can be at the airport by midnight easily. As soon as you've gone, I'll ring and cancel my seat on the Paris plane, then book it in your name. But, Max, it... Have you got a passport? Good. Go to Paris and stay there till you hear from me. I'll take care of things here. I can make this look like suicide. Oh, darling, don't send me away from you. Do you really think I want to spend the rest of my life on the run? Afraid to turn around in case I feel a policeman's hand on my shoulder? Blackmail is my line, Helen, not murder. Do you think I'd even consider marrying a murderess? If you don't like the thought of prison, then be on that plane. You, you can't mean it. I mean every word of it. Now listen to me, you little fool. I can fix things here. No one saw us come in. Leave this end to me and stay away from me. Now get out while the going's good. I should have let you go. I must have been crazy not to have seen you for what you really are. Darling, I wish you had. Now the gun. Get the fingerprints wiped off and... There, that should do it. Put it on the floor about... About here. His glass, yes. Now mine. And a letter from Helen. Ah, yes, here we are. My darling Max, I want you to know that I... Yes. Yes, just the thing. Now, crumple it up. Hmm. Couldn't be better. Helen's fingerprints... No, no, she was wearing gloves. Now the phone. Hello, London Airport. Oh, this is Max Gerard. 
I had a seat booked on the midnight flight to Paris. Yes, that's right, Air France. That seat is being taken over by Miss Helen Morgan. Yes, that's right, Helen Morgan. Yes, she'll be at the airport in, uh, in approximately half an hour. Uh, thank you. Good night. I think, after all, I might try one of your cigars, Sir Michael, while we both wait. Hello. Police? This is Max Gerard speaking. Yes. I think you'd better send someone over here right away. Yes, that's right. I've just killed a man. And furthermore, the night of the jury. The prosecution firmly believes, and indeed will prove to you beyond a shadow of doubt, that the defendant, Max Gerard, shot down his victim in cold blood when his attempt to extort money from Sir Michael Morgan met with the contempt, the scorn, and refusal it so richly deserved. We will prove to you, gentlemen of the jury, that learned counsel for the defense has no foundation in fact on which to establish the defendant's innocence. The crown will further prove... Your name is Max Gerard, is it not? It is. Mr. Gerard, will you tell the court just how you earn your living? By my wit? And you. <laughs> Would it not be safer, and indeed more accurate, Mr. Gerard, to describe your profession as that of a common blackmailer? prisoner guilty or not guilty? We find the prisoner guilty as charged. Sometimes we may wonder why a football team doesn't quit playing and walk off the field when it finds itself 50 points behind with only a few minutes of play to go. What is that indomitable spirit that fills men with hope and keeps them going in spite of terrific odds? Keeps them going just to play the game according to the rules. Just to get the job done as well as they know how. This kind of spirit pervaded the feelings of heavy bomber crews of the Ninth Air Force on that day of glory, August 1st, 1943. The day of one of the most secretly planned surprise bombing missions of World War II. The day of the low-level attack on the Romanian oil refineries at Roeste. More than 170 B-24 heavily loaded bombers took off in a swirl of red dust from Benghazi, Libya to bomb a highly defended priority target. The element of surprise in the low-level attack was to be one of their greatest weapons. But things went wrong from the start. Three planes exploded during takeoff operations. Eleven more aborted due to engine trouble. Of those that reached the target area, less than one-third returned to home base. The leaders of the mission encountered navigation difficulties and difficulty in identifying the specific targets. And due to the loss of that elemental hope, surprise, they also encountered devastating enemy firepower from flak and fighters. The mission was partially successful, but a horrifying experience. Five medals of honor were awarded to the heroes of the Ploeste raid for valorous action above and beyond the call of duty. At any time, the men would have been justified in turning back. But they had a code of conduct that made them want to see the unequal game through to the end. It was a job that had to be done. A charge of the light brigade in the air as they flew down the valley of death to glory. Peters, for the umpteenth time this week. Can't you do better than that? Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Gerard, but I never was that good at chess. Working in a jail makes a man's brain sluggish, I reckon. Oh? Uh, I should have thought in a job like this that you'd have had all the practice in the world. Not all of them like chess, you see. And... Well, let's try again, shall we? Come on, set him up. Yeah. I must admit, though, Mr. Gerard, that you don't half play a hard game to beat. You've got to concentrate, man. Think further ahead than your opponent. I'll play without my queen and... Is there something wrong, Mr. Gerard? Hmm? 
No. No, I was just thinking of a night I spent at Michelle. Wait, I don't Hold know a place of that name. And then you must go there sometime, Peters. The music is discreet, the cuisine excellent, the service impressive. And you meet the most enchanting people. If you'd rather not play then, Mr. Jones. What? Oh, yes. Hmm. If I win this game, Peters, I'm afraid there's no hope for you. Now, let's see. Uh, yes. Um, King's Knight to Bishop Three. That's right. Yes, sir. Yes, right, one, sir. Has the river patrol been notified? Very good, sir. Yes, I'll take Detective Sergeant Wardrop and get down to the embankment right away. All right, Wardrop. Let's get going. Looks like another waterfront killing and... Hey, Wardrop, I'm talking to you. Uh, what? Oh, sorry, Bertie. Are you still thinking of that Gerard case? Or... Yes, I am. There's something I don't like about it. Look, it's the first time you've handled a murder case, isn't it? Yes, but... I can remember the first one I was on. Once the poor devil had been sentenced, I began to have all sorts of doubts. Wondering if I'd interpreted the facts correctly and all that sort of thing. Oh, it's not only that. It's the fact that, from the little we know about Gerard's past activities, this murder's out of character. Now, listen to me, Wardrop. If people didn't step out of character, there wouldn't be any murderers. Right? I suppose so, but... Who was it rang us up in the first place to admit the killing? Gerard. Whose fingerprints were all over the gun? Gerard, but... And the letter from that girl was still there, lying on the floor where Sir Michael must have thrown it, wasn't it? It all fits, I admit that. Yes, and then at the last minute, Gerard changes his mind and claims the police forced a confession out of him. Pleads not guilty. Tries to claim he was beaten up. Ha, <laughs> ha, no. No, Gerard's a no hope of Wardrop. I've known more than one blackmailer try his hand at murder. If you ask me, you're wasting your sympathy on a man who sponged on women all his life. But there's the girl. Where's she? She can't have just disappeared into thin air. Ah, oh, she'll turn up. Wouldn't you want to vanish if you were in her shoes? And discovered that the man you were in love with was going to blackmail your father? Well, uh, come on. We've got to get down to the embankment. Come in. Uh, Detective Inspector Burton, sir. There's a young lady here who says she's got to see you at once. Uh, says it's urgent, sir. What's her name? Uh, Miss Ellen Morgan, sir. Ellen Morgan? Uh, show it in, Constable. Uh, will you go in, Miss? Thank you. This might be it, Burton. I'd like to speak to the man who was in charge of the case against Max Gerard. Ah, won't you sit down, Miss Morgan? I'm Detective Inspector Burton, and this is Detective Sergeant Wardrop. He's the man you want. I'll leave you to it, Wardrop. Right, sir. Uh, we've been very anxious to find you, Miss Morgan. I hope not for too much, Wardrop. Mr. Wardrop, you've got to stop them hanging Max Gerard. You've got to. Uh, Sergeant, miss. Now, supposing we start with first things first, Miss Morgan. There isn't time for that, don't you see? In four days from now, he's due to... to... He didn't do it. You know who did it, then? Of course I know. Now, listen to me, Sergeant. It was like this. Max was booked to go to France on the midnight plane that night. I pleaded with him not to go. I followed him out to Michelle's, and... I said if he'd made up his mind, well, then I'd drive him to the airport. But I drove him to my home. I persuaded him to talk to my father. And then... When he got... Something's come up that makes it imperative that we go back over the events of that night. The night of Sir Michael Morgan's death, Gerard. Uh, you'll move, I think, Peter. Uh, Mr. Gerard, I think we... It's better... all right, Peter. Oh, you don't want to talk about it. Now, Gerard? Wardrop, the case is closed. Finished. And so are you, Peters. Checkmate. Hmm. Very neat. Uh, did you know that uh, Ellen Morgan has returned to London? No, I didn't. She wants the case reopened. What's wrong? Hasn't she got a pound of flesh? She claims that she killed her father. She claims what? Her story is quite convincing, Gerard. In some respect, it falls into place very neatly. You were at Michelle's with her that night. You did leave, and she followed you out, right? Correct. You'd said goodbye to her at your table. You were trying... You were flying, that is, to France on the midnight plane. True. What made you change your mind? According to Miss Morgan, she drove you to her home, where you both spoke with her father. He tried to buy you off when you asked to marry his daughter, and when he couldn't do that, he produced a gun. There was a struggle between he and his daughter, and the gun was fired. I see. Tell me, Wardrop, 
Did you see any sign of a struggle when you got there? Uh, no, but... Do you think if there was the faintest chance for me, I wouldn't grab at it, clutch it like a drowning man? Why do you think I changed my plea to not guilty at the last moment? Because I was terrified, Wardrop. Because I realized I put a noose around my neck. Why'd you change your mind about that plane ticket? Why'd you ring the airport and book a seat for Miss Morgan, cancelling your own at the same time? I've checked the time of that call, Gerard. And it must have been shortly before or right after Sir Michael was killed. Well, Doc, I'm touched that Miss Morgan should go to such lengths on my behalf. But hell hath no fury like a woman, etc., etc. Where's she been all this time? Why has she left until now to come forward? Does it occur to you that she might be trying to, um, prolong the agony? I killed her father, Wardrop. If she could arrange me to start hoping, hoping that she really could help me, wouldn't it be much more satisfying for her when she kicked the ground from under my feet? You haven't answered any of my questions. Ah, oh, the phone call to the airport. When I left Michelle's, Helen did follow me, and she did say she'd drive me there. I knew that I had to get rid of her. After all, I had an appointment with her father with regard to a certain letter. I'd laid the foundation of my plan to get rid of her in Michelle's when I told her I was tired of him and was going to Paris. Go on. Well, she started to drive and began to plead with me not to go. She said she'd do anything I asked if I'd only stay with her. So I told her then that I had a letter she'd written to me that I intended to sell it to her father. The letter you found in Sir Michael's drawing room. Yes? <laughs> oh, that did the trick, all right. She stopped the car and began to tell me that she'd never be able to face her father. We argued back and forth for some time, but... Suddenly she stopped pleading with me and said she was going to leave England, that she wanted to go away and hide. She's a very emotional girl, Wardrop. And it was then that you thought of letting her have your seat on the plane. Exactly. I got rid of her and rang the airport to cancel my own seat and book it for her. Then, with Helen safely out of the way, I went to see her father. The rest you know. She did tell me that she'd been unaware of the fact that we were looking for her. Where has she been all this time? In a little village called Leclerc in the south of France. She claimed that she couldn't bring herself to even buy a newspaper... She wanted to forget that she'd killed her father. Or oh, try to. Wardrop, well, you haven't a very high opinion of me, have you? What if I haven't? <laughs> Do you think if Helen Morgan had been in that room with me when her father was shot that I would have helped her get away? I'd have done my darndest to incriminate her. All right, Gerard, have it your way. If you like, you can give her a message for me. Such as what? Tell her I, I think I'm much safer where I am. Here I've only the Lord and Peter's abominable chest to contend with. Out there, Helen Morgan loved her father very dearly, Wardrop. I wonder just what kind of revenge she has in mind for the man who killed him. But you can't let him die. You can't. Oh, how many more times do I have to tell you I'm the one you're looking for? Don't you see that he knew that with what you know about his past, you'd believe him guilty? Miss Morgan... We've checked his story a dozen times. He's not worth what you're going through, nor the sacrifice you're trying to make. And he won't even see me. Do you know why, Sergeant Wardrop? Because he's afraid I'd make him tell the truth. Oh, he planned it beautifully. From the time my father was killed. When he saw that I wouldn't leave, he told me he wasn't going to marry a murderer, that he wanted only to be rid of me. Well, I'd lost my father. I'd killed him. And from that moment on, I thought I'd lost Max, too. And he set out to save me at the cost of his own life. While I hid myself away in this in my grief and shame. Miss Morgan, you're forgetting one thing. At his trial, Gerard changed his plea. He claimed we'd forced a confession from him. I know why he did that. He had to be the Max Gerard that you knew until the end. He wanted you to think that he was searching desperately for a way of escape. To convince everyone that he was a guilty and... And frightened man. Oh, I brought your cigarettes, Mr. Gerard. Oh, thanks. Uh, Peters, will you do me another favor? Uh, I can, sir. When this is uh, over, will you go and see Helen Morgan? If that's what you want, sir, yes. Tell her... Tell her that when the pain is gone, I hope she'll sometimes remember... The music at Michelle. Another visit with Joe and Daphne Forsythe. Joe. Joe. 
Joe. <sighs> Joseph. Yeah, yeah, I'm up. I'm up. Pour the coffee. I'll be right in. Relax. It's three in the morning. Huh? I said relax. It's three in the morning. I was relaxed. Daphne, why did you wake me up? Well, I was just wondering what happened to our savings bonds. You were what? I had a dream. I dreamed you lost all of your money and all we had left were our savings bonds. I see. So I just wanted to make sure they were all all right. They're all right. They're with the other important papers. You sure? Of course I'm sure. Well, I just don't want anything to happen to them. Savings bonds are the most secure form of investment. Why, the whole faith and credit of the United States stand behind those bonds of ours. Uh Uh-huh. So they're even better than dollars in your pocket because the government stands behind them and protects them. Uh Uh-huh. And they protect us too, Joe. Every bond is an investment in our country, in our security and freedoms. (coughs) Joe? (coughs) Well, how about that? He feels so secure he went back to sleep. Mm. Good night, darling. Be listening for another mounting drama of action and suspense when we again bring you The Eleventh Hour. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Ever had that eerie feeling of being watched? There's no one there. At least, nobody you can see anyway. But still, you can feel those ghostly eyes upon you, the watchers in the shadows waiting for their moment to scare you, haunt you, or something even worse. That is the theme for these carefully selected creepy true stories of the paranormal designed to have you wondering if you too are being watched from the shadows. This all-new collection includes stories about the Hat Man, Black-Eyed Kids, Shadow People, Poltergeists, UFOs, the premonitions of a dying man, forest demons, and much more, all absolutely true, all chosen by the master of the paranormal himself, G. Michael Vasey. Watched from the Shadows, Scary True Stories of the Paranormal, available now on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. about the United Nations? Anxious about those bills piling up? Want to get away from it all? CBS offers you Escape. You are the victim of a native witch doctor pursued from the west coast of Africa to the west end of London by the grinning face of a dead man. You are under the curse of a poorer man. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Escape, produced and directed by William N. Robeson, 
and carefully plotted to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape to the dark lowlands of West Africa and the mind of a man who scoffed at native magic. As H.G. Wells paints it in his gripping story, Pollock and the Pora Man. I had spent considerable time in Africa, but I have given little credence to the many superstitions of the natives there. Voodoo curses, weird incantations of witch doctors and the like had always seemed a pretty silly business to me. But that was before the affair of Pollock and the Pora Man. Even then, while the thing was happening, I took little notice. It was only when I got back to England some months later and went to see Pollock climbing up the three flights of stairs to his lonely bedroom that I began to realize the ghastly truth of it. One look at him was enough. I had never before seen a man so unnaturally wasted, so prematurely aged and broken, so eerily mad as this man lying on the bed and looking up at me with haggard eyes. It was... It was good of you to come, Waterhouse. Nonsense, old chap. I just thought I'd look you up and say hello. But I had no idea I would find you ill. Ill? <laughs> yes, I... I suppose I am ill. I, I suppose that's what you'd call it. But what in heaven's name is the matter, Pollock? I, uh... I say, come closer, will you? I can barely see you. Oh, I, well, yes, of course, I... I'll just drop a chair. And... Oh, no, no. Pollock, man, what's the matter? Oh, no. Take it away. Take it away. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> what is it, that, man? That thing in your hand. Take it away, please, for heaven's sake. What? Take it away. In my hand? Yes. But, but Pollock, this is only my hat. Your... Hat? Why, yes, of course. Just an ordinary black Hamburg. Now, if its style is offensive oh, to no, you, I... Oh, no, I... I just put it on the table, the floor, somewhere where I can't see it, please. Well, of course, old man. Yes, I... I s suppose you think I'm mad. Oh, I don't be. I know you do. Everybody does. Because I'm used to it now. And the worst of it is... That perhaps I am. I say, Pollock. Only I don't think so. Because I do see it. I don't care if no one else does. I can see it. Well, see what? The head. That hideous face following me everywhere, grinning at me, and and always upside down. Pollock, what are you talking about? Uh, you don't believe me either. Well, look at my wrist. It's broken. The bandage is still on it. That's real enough, isn't it? Well, yes, of course. Uh, broken, you say? Yes. It did that. And my other accident, when I first got back to England, they said I walked in front of a bus, but I know better. It did that too. A head? Exactly. You wouldn't expect to see a man's head come rolling down the middle of a busy street in London, now, would you? Now, oh, Pollock, you'd better lie back, rest a bit. I I'll call a doctor. Oh, you too. <laughs> and I thought you might understand. After all, you were with me when it started. It was you who first warned me, who sent me home. You don't mean that that business with the poor man? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. You remember how it started? We were camped at that little village on the lagoon behind the Turner Peninsula. It was swampy and hot and I was bored to tears. Maybe that's why I did it. But anyway, when, when I got back, you were furious with me. No, 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 you're a fool, Pollock. You've got to take it back immediately, do you hear? Oh, what possible difference could it make, Waterhouse? Why all this fuss, old boy? It's only a little wooden statue. Can't be worth anything except for a curio. You're not that stupid, Pollock. You know very well this is a poor idol. You must have stolen it from the hut of a witch doctor. Well, and what of it? Don't you see? To them, this is sacred. As sacred as an altar cross to a Christian. You've not only committed a crime in their eyes, but a terrible sacrilege as well. <laughs> oh, don't tell me they're going to sick their painted gods on me. <laughs> oh, I should be frightened to death. Before they can do anything, you're going to take this back where you found it and apologize to the poro man. Apologize to an illiterate black witch man? Are you crazy? Pollock, I've had about as much of you as I can stand. You're one of those infernal fools who think a black man isn't a human being. I can't turn my back, but you're running crossways to them, getting to some scrape or other. The third time this month, and this time it's serious. Are you telling me you're going to send me home? 
I honestly think it would be best. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm all for it. I'd be very happy to get out of this sticky, dirty, godforsaken place. Very well. But before you go, Pollock, for the good of the expedition, you've got to take that thing back and apologize. Oh, I... I don't think I'd better. Hmm? Why not? Well, to tell the truth, I don't think they'd give me a chance to apologize. All right. Tell me, what happened? Oh, nothing very much, except... Well, as I was carrying the thing away, one of those chaps popped up and saw it. Started yelling, trying to take it from me. Yes, go on. Well, we had a bit of a tussle. I got away. Go on, Pollock. We, uh... We were on the bank of the river, and I, uh... I toppled him over, that's all. He fell into the river? Yes, I... think he may have hit the rocks first. Was he badly hurt? I don't know. I didn't stop to find out. He was dead, wasn't he? I really don't know. Oh, you fool. Oh, it was an accident. I had no... An accident? A lot they care. It was bad enough with the idol, but you've probably killed a man. We're in for it now. Well, there's nothing to be frightened about. Nothing? In the first place, I should think even your conscience would suffer a little. The second, you don't seem to understand about this Pora business. It rules the country. It's the law, religion, medicine, everything. And these Pora are the most vindictive men on earth. The one whose idol you stole and whose follower you killed will be duty-bound to do something about it. And there's no telling what he will do. Oh, come now. You don't believe in these voodoo curses and things? Of course not. I'm thinking of something much more real than that. <laughs> I mean, you might try something rough. I can only advise you to lie low until we can get you out of here in the morning. I'll take you as far as Sulima and see you safe aboard a steamer. You needn't. I can go alone from here. Not far. You still don't understand this business. You wouldn't get a quarter of a mile from this camp alone. I... I still thought you were making a mountain out of a molehill waterhouse. But I must admit, I, I didn't sleep much that night. I lay there on the mat in my hut and listened to the sounds of the village. And then later to the noises of the, of the night-wakening jungle. Sometime after midnight, I, I must have dozed off because I awoke with a start. For a moment, I was confused, but I sensed something wrong. And then, framed against the moonlight square of the door, I saw a hand upraised, and in it, a knife. Stop it! Stop or I'll shoot! Stop, you devil, you! Pollock, what is it? What happened? I missed the beggar Waterhouse. I missed... Who missed who? What happened? The poorer man. Waterhouse, he was in my hut. He had a knife. He... He tried to kill me. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait till I find a light. There. Are you all right, man? Yeah, I'm all right. I just saw it in time. I rolled aside and... Hmm? Look. Hey. In my bed. The knife... Oh, that was a narrow one. Well, perhaps now you understand the seriousness of this. Waterhouse, I saw his face. He stopped just at the door for a second. He was crouched down and he looked back at me from under his arm. His face was etched clearly in the moonlight. It... it was upside down. I'll never forget it. Uh, I'll get you a drink. Listen, Waterhouse, listen... He glared back at me with his painted face upside down and streaked with those hideous scars they cut in their cheeks. Well, see that in my dreams. Oh, steady on, old man. Yeah. Here you are. Drink this. All right. What else? Hmm? The idol's gone. I've just noticed the idol's gone. He took it. It's gone. Yes. Well, then it's all over. He got what he wants. He uh, won't bother me again, will he? I'm afraid there's more to it than that. But he's got the blasted idol back, and he he, he won't try it again, oh, uh, will he? I've just noticed something too, Pollock. There's something here on the floor. One of your shots clipped off the tip of his little finger. It's too bad you aren't a better shot. Well, well, why? Uh, well, why'd you say that? Because I'm afraid we haven't seen the last of this business yet. <laughs> Oh, 
you were more right than you knew, Waterhouse. The next morning was only the beginning. We were standing by the river and supervising packing. I'm glad we're getting out of here. There's something brewing, or things wouldn't be so quiet. Oh, what would be brewing? A stink in a copper pot, probably. Dancing in a circle of skulls, putting curses on you. Oh, that. What can he do? How the devil should I know? They're versatile people. They know a lot of rum dodges. The best thing to do... Look out! Oh, man, that was close. What, what was it? One of their beastly poisoned arrows in the tree behind you. Missed your head by inches. No. No. It came from over there in the bush. Well, let's... Let's do something. Let's chase him something. No use now. Never find him in there. Best thing for us to do is to get out of here quick. Well, we... We got out all right. You remember how we went down the river, keeping as far from the banks as possible? <laughs> you thought I was safe when you got me to Salima and said goodbye, didn't you, Waterhouse? So did I. You said goodbye and went back to the interior. Nothing happened for two days, and I was beginning to feel that the whole thing was just a nasty dream. And then, then as I was walking in the compound, I was hit in the arm with a slug. It was a long shot. The bullet was spent. I only got a flesh wound. But I knew he was there. And I decided to confide in Berea, the little Portuguese who had rented me a hut in his compound. He took it seriously. It is a personal question, you know. It's revenge, see? And he must hurry because you will leave the country. Yes, I'll be on the boat to Freetown in three more days. Then I'll be rid of him forever. Uh, perhaps. Then there's this magic. Of course, I don't believe in it. Superstition. <laughs> uh, but... Still, it's not, it's not nice to think that wherever you are, there's a black man spends a moonlight night sometimes dancing around a fire to send you bad dreams. You have any bad dreams? Mm. Well, there. Keep seeing the beggar's head upside down, grinning at me, showing all his teeth the way he did in the hut. Now, it's nothing to be afraid of. It's not pleasant, either. Then they say poor men send snakes. Uh, you seen any snakes lately? Well, only one. I killed one this morning on the floor under my hammock. Almost stepped on him when I got up. Oh, of course, it is coincidence. Still, I would keep eyes open. Uh, then there is the pains in the legs and arms. I thought they were caused by miasma. Oh, probably they are. When did they begin? Why, three nights ago, the night... Ah. Oh, blasted, it's nonsense. If I could just meet this devil face to face, with a gun in my hand... Ah, you might shoot him, but then he might shoot you. I think he do not want to kill you. Anyway, not yet. Their idea is scare and worry a man with their spells and narrow misses and pains and bad dreams and all that until he... He's sick of life. <laughs> of, of course, it's all talk, see? You must not worry about it. No, 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 of course not. But uh, I wonder what he'll be up to next. Perhaps it is I who shall be up to something. What do you mean? Never mind. But I'm not one to just sit and take this. That very afternoon, I had a conversation with a roughneck Mendai tribesman I found there in Salima. He showed me a little iron dagger and demonstrated how one struck at the back of the neck. He agreed to do the job for the price of a double-barrel gun with an ornamented lock. I went back to Perea's, feeling better than I had in days. That night, the Portuguese and I were sitting in his living room playing cards... When suddenly the Mendai rough strode in without so much as a knock. Who is it? What do you want? Oh, what's you? Have done what you tell me. Have proof. What is it you have in the package? Is that blood dripping? Proof. Here. His head. Oh, no, Sacre no, Christ. no. This man you want, now 
I get gone. You didn't have to bring this. I didn't ask for such proof. You mean, Senor Pollock, you got him killed? You did not kill him yourself? Why should I? But he will not be able to take it off now. What do you mean, take it off? Look at the cards. They are all spoiled with this blood. What do you mean, take what off? Uh, you must send me a new pack from Freetown. You can't buy them there. Take what off? It is only a superstition, I forgot. Uh, the natives say if the witch... Uh, he was a witch. <laughs> but it is all rubbish. Go on, go on. Well, they say you must take, uh, make the poor old man uh, take the curse off or kill him yourself. It is very silly. Gone. No. Yes. I'll make you two guns if you'll take that beastly thing away. No. One gun. No. Oh. All right. Freya, that gun you have for sale, give it to him. I have the money right here. Yes, yes. Over here. Now, take it and go. Thanks. It is funny how the head sits upside down. Just the way I saw him that night. Just the way I see him in my dreams. Like it was weighted that way. Uh, you will take him with you when you go. Maybe take him now. Uh, my cards are all spoiled. Uh, there is a man who sells them in Freetown. You should have killed him yourself. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it! <laughs> I took the thing to my hut, and no matter what I did, it always came to rest upside down and glaring at me. I got a shovel. I buried it in the soft earth behind the hut. But in the middle of the night, I was awakened by some sound in my room. Oh, what is it? Who's there? Speak up or I'll shoot! Uh, oh, a dog. Only a dog. Yes, it, it's only a, a dog. But in the morning, when I awoke and started to get out of bed, there it was in the center of the floor, glaring at me upside down. It was uncanny until I remembered the dog. I found his paw prints in the dug-up earth outside and I knew how it got there. I took the thing down to the river. I threw it as far as I could into the current. At last I'd be rid of it. That morning, I killed two snakes. But... Late in the afternoon, a little steamer arrived that would take me away from this insane land of the Pharaoh and Freetown and civilization. I had almost begun to feel gay as that boat carried me swiftly away from the shores of the Pepora land. At last I would be free and soon I'd be back where Pora and curses and nightmares would be forgotten. I was standing at the rail, sighing with relief when the captain of the steamer whom I'd met before strolled up and began to make conversation. After the usual exchange of pleasantries, he said, I picked up a rum curio on the beach this go. It's a thing I never saw done this side of Inji before. Why is that so? Uh, the head of one of these porrot chaps, all ornamented with knife cuts. What? I see. what's the matter, old chap? You're green in the face. I wouldn't have took you for a bad sailor. Oh, I'm... I'm, I'm quite all right. Uh, well, this head I was telling you about is a bit queer in a way. I've got it in a jar of spirits in my cabin, and I'm hanged if it don't float upside down. What? Uh, here I see, old chap. What's the matter? Uh, Stuart! Stuart! That was the last straw, I suppose. Something seemed to snap in my brain. I... And for the rest of the voyage, I lay there in the bunk, staring at the ceiling. And I had the strange sensation that the boat was made of glass, transparent, and that I could see up through the ceiling into the captain's cabin, see the poorer man's face floating in a jar of alcohol upside down, grinning at me. I, 
Was the actual head is still in the captain's cabin in Freetown, but it didn't matter. The poorer man's work had been done by then, because now I carried it with me everywhere in my brain. I saw it everywhere, anywhere. Any object that was round like a hat or a pillar of ours suddenly developed features when I looked at it. Ugly, scarred features with a grinning, mocking mouth. Features turned upside down. When I... When I docked in London, I, I went straight to my banker's office in Cornhill. And the security is all in order, Mr. Pollock. You shall have to watch things, of course, but all in all, you shall have enough to live quite comfortably and to enjoy a reasonable amount of freedom. Then, too... <clears throat> I say, Pollock, what are you staring at so fixedly? Uh, that thing, hanging from your mantelpiece. Oh, yes, I see. The potted fern. Rather pretty one, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, very pretty. I must do something about it, though. It's always dripping water down on the fender of the fireplace. Makes it rusty. I was wondering about that. It looks red, almost like, like blood. Rust, you know. Yes. Oh, by the way, that reminds me. Can you recommend a physician for... Mental troubles. I've got a little, uh, what do you call it? Uh, hallucination. The poor man grinned at me fiendishly, and I stared back at him. The banker watched me very curiously for a moment, and then he gave me the address of a doctor, and I left his office. That's when my accident happened. To a man who's been many months in the jungle of busy London streets, confusing enough. But when a head comes rolling down the middle of the street and between your legs... No! 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 I was in the hospital for weeks. The only permanent injury, however, was the loss of the tip of my little finger. By strange coincidence... The same fingertip of the left hand that I'd shot off the poorer man that first night. Well, even in the hospital, the poorer man was with me all the time, everywhere. The doctors couldn't help me. My friends couldn't either. So I, I tried cycling in the country. But that thing kept rolling along beside me and getting tangled up in the wheels and spilling me. That's, that's, that's how I got the broken wrist. It, uh, well, the, the worst came only last week. I'd just come back from a long walk, hoping to be tired enough to go to sleep. And as usual, that bronze vase was over there in front of the big French window. And it, <laughs> well, perhaps the poor man enjoys the view of the street three floors below. Anyway, this night, I felt a little devil may care, so I turned round to it and I looked him in the eye and I said, So, you're still here, are you, my ugly shadow? Yes, Paula, I'm still here. What? What? What did you say? I said I'm still here. And I always will be. <laughs> no, 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 not that too, not that, no, 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 no! So, now you understand, Waterhouse. I not only see the poorer man, I hear him too. Holocaust, chip. This is frightful. Oh, it is, rather, isn't it? I mean, you are ill, man, very ill. Now, oh, surely there's something someone can do, some doctor. What can any doctor do? Can he take off the poorer man's curse? Now, Pollock, that's nonsense. And you know it. Oh, is it? Of course, man. It, it, it's all in your mind. All, what do they call it, uh, suggestion. The power of suggestion is strong. You're impressionable. You've let these stories prey on your mind, and you've got to snap out oh, of it. Oh, I should have killed him myself. Pollock. I'd do it, too, with my bare hands, if only I had the chance. Man, you're talking rot. Look at him there. Look at him grinning at me. Pollock, that's only a bronze vase. Always grinning at me, more and more fiendishly every day. Stop it, stop it, you devil, stop it, you hear? Pollock, calm stop yourself. It. Fly back. Rest. 
red, red, yes. Yes. That's, that's what I need. Oh, if I'd only yeah. known, I'd never have left you there in Sulima alone. All this might have been prevented. Oh, might it? Listen, Waterhouse. When you came in, I was just lying here thinking, I see him, I hear him, my sense of sight and of hearing is affected. And someday, my sense of touch will go too. When it does, I know that will be the end. I'll be finished. And the poor man will finally have his revenge. Won't he? Pollock, old man. When you came in, I was lying here, trying to get up the nerve to walk over there and make the test. And I'm going to do it. No, no, I won't now, let you. you can't stop me, Waterhouse. Don't you see? I've got to. I can't go on like this. I've got to know. Have it over with. No, Pollock. It's beyond anything you can do. Stand aside. But stand aside, please. Now. Come back to bed, Pollock. That window is open. If you have a... Never fever... mind. This is... Just an ordinary bronze vase. Isn't it, Waterhouse? Pollock, don't do it. I know it's only a bronze vase. I know that when I... I will feel only cold metal when I reach out and touch it. I know. Like this. Oh, 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 Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and tonight brought you Pollock and the Poorer Man by H.G. Wells, adapted for radio by John Dunkel, with Barton Yarborough as Pollock, Louis Van Ruten as Waterhouse, and Bill Conrad as Perea. The special musical score was conceived and conducted by Cy Fuhrer. Next week... You are groping through the darkened corridors of a gigantic department store in the dead of night. And suddenly you realize you're not alone. That a hundred eyes are glaring at you from the shadows. A hundred hands reaching for your throat. Next week, escape with John Collier's eerie story, Evening Primrose. Good night, then, until this same time next week when CBS again offers you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Now, step into the incredible, amazing future as we go... Exploring Tomorrow! And now, here is your guide to these adventures of the mind, 
the editor of astounding science fiction magazine, John Campbell, Jr. The essential character of any frontier you explore is that if you get into it and stick your neck out, you get it lopped off and there's no help. The frontier is the place where there isn't any reserve, where there isn't anyone to help you if you get into trouble. There is no support. Tonight's story is a story of a true frontier. You know, sometimes the frontier lies just the other side of a doorway. It doesn't seem very different, but it can be the difference between life and sudden death. Uh, we are in a somewhat different position. We can summon support here. I can push my little push button here and summon our supporters. You know, when we think of that glamorous future, we sometimes tend to forget that things cost money now and things will cost in the future. Let's suppose that there are ships and they are going out between the worlds. They carry emergency supplies for the expeditions that may be in trouble on some of the planets that are being explored. But they can't carry an extra lot of them. It costs too much. They carry parachutes, in effect, to drop them as they flash by the world that's in trouble. Little parachutes for space, a plastic bubble with a tiny motor, just enough to lower it down to the planet without destruction. Uh, they'd probably use human pilots to do it, too. Because, you know, a human brain is the lightest of all computing devices. It's lighter than an electronic computer. It would be cheaper and wiser to use human pilots to drop these little plastic bubble parachutes of space to a planet in trouble. Let's consider one where there's an expedition that's gotten into medical trouble. The men are sick and they need a serum that they don't have. They've called for help from one of the passing interstellar liners. The liner has stopped for a moment dropped one of its little space parachutes and gone on its way, flashing on to some other star somewhere else. And in that emergency dispatch ship, that little space parachute, the pilot discovers... I'm not somebody who shouldn't be there is in that supplies closet. The gauge is never wrong. It says there's a living human body inside that closet radiating heat. Come on out, chum. Open that door, I'll open it. Come on out. Oh, no. All right. I, I give up. Now what? Sit down. All right. Well, you still haven't told me. I mean, what happens now? Do I pay a fine or something? What are you doing here? Well, I just wanted to see my brother, that's all. Your brother? Mm -hmm. He's on Woden. He's with Group 2. Oh. I haven't seen him for ten years, ever since he went there. What's his name? Cross. Jerry Cross. Do you know him? Only his name. I've never met him. Oh, I was only eight years old when he left. What was your original destination aboard the Stardust? Mimir. I had a job to go to. You knew you were breaking a rule when you stowed away on this ship? Oh, I knew I was breaking some kind of regulation. Is that all it means to you? Well, I'm There not... was a sign posted there. Didn't you see it? A sign? Yeah. Oh, you mean the one that, that, that said unauthorized personnel, keep out? That's the one. Oh, well, I guess I saw and it. And ignored it. Oh, come on. Now, look, don't be so grim. <sighs> How did you manage to stow away? Oh, it was easy. I, I just saw my chance and <laughs> acted on impulse. I, I saw there was plenty of room in that closet, and so here I am. Yeah, here you are. Oh, please, don't worry. I'll be a model criminal or prisoner or whatever it is I am now. And I'll pay for my keep, too. And when we get to Woden, well, I'll, I'll make myself useful. Quiet. Sorry. Do you have an identification disc? Yes. Give it to me. Well, my, my name is Marilyn. Marilyn. Let Cross. me have the disc. Okay. Will I get it back? No. Oh, but I'm sorry, I... I need the information on it. I have to put it all in my report. But when you've got all the information, surely I'll get it back. I need it. Do you know why I'm flying this ship to Woden? No. No idea? Well, I I know the Stardust got a message. I, I suppose you're taking extra equipment. I'm taking serum. Oh. If I don't get that serum to Woden, six men are going to die. My brother, too? Not if he's with Group 2. He's 28,000 miles away from all this. On the opposite side of the planet. 
Opposite side? Well, then how will I get to see him? You're not going there. Not go- I'm sorry. Look, I, I don't understand. You are going to work. Yes. Well, then if... But you're not. You're going to leave this ship. You mean I won't get to see Jerry? I'm afraid not. Oh, please. I told you I... I'm sorry. Well, what are you going to do, radio some other ship to have me take him back? There are no other ships to radio. Well, then... Don't you understand? No. You can't stay aboard this ship. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Jump overboard out into space? You won't have to jump. What? You'll be jettisoned. You won't feel a thing. Sometimes the universe seems cruel. I think that's a mistake. It isn't cruel, but it is ruthless. You must learn the lessons. And once you've learned them, you're all right. Unless you forget them. I'm afraid that girl forgot that there were frontiers. That there were places where there was no help. You are joking. These are not things you joke about. Oh, no, you can't mean all this. There is nothing anyone can do for you. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I mean, I just can't believe you're really serious. I... But you are. Do mean that you're going to make me die? It's the way it has to be. No. no human being in the universe can help please, you. Please, oh, please. Nobody wants it this way. Nobody would ever let it be this way if it were humanly no, possible to no, change no, it. I can't believe I it. I told you, this ship is carrying fever serum to six men on Woden. All six will die unless I get there. I know, I know you told me. A small ship like this one is provided with barely enough fuel to get to its destination. If you stay aboard, your added weight, once we hit gravity, will cause it to use up all its fuel before we land. That means, in simple terms, you and I will die and six other men will die waiting for the serum. Is that it? That's it. Just that? We don't have enough fuel? Yeah. Shall I just die alone or take seven other men with me? That's how it stacks up. And nobody really wants me to die. Nobody does. Well, then maybe. I, I mean, are you sure nothing... Nothing can be done for you. I just can't believe this is real. Less than an hour ago, I was a passenger in the Stardust. Now I'm on this ship. And I'm going to die. And nobody cares. That's not true. We all care. <laughs> It's different out here. It's not like being back on Earth. I'll never see Mom and Daddy again. I'll never see Jerry. I'll never see anything again. Hasn't hasn't your brother ever written to you? Yes. What did he talk about? Things. I mean... Well, all the things... He was doing and how much he wanted to see us all again. Didn't he ever tell you about frontier law? What? Look, out here we live by a different set of values. I don't know anything about frontier law. You ignored a warning. Out here you can only make that mistake just once. Oh, a lot of mistakes have been made. And a lot of men have died making I it. don't know what you're talking about. I don't know about frontiers. I don't know about fuel. Or what was going to happen to me. I don't want to die. Why should I have to die? Just because I wanted to see my brother. <laughs> what's the use of trying to make her understand? What do I do? Quote the regulation to her. Paragraph L, Section 8, Interstellar Regulations. Quote, any stowaway discovered aboard an emergency dispatch ship will be immediately upon discovery jettisoned into space, period. End quote. And what good would it do to her anyway? Okay, so H amount of fuel will not power an EDS with a mass of M plus X safely to its destination. How could she understand that? Look at her. 18 years old, brown curly hair, blue eyes, weight 110 pounds. 
And to me, she's just the unwanted factor in a very cold <laughs> equation. Crying won't help, will it? I mean, you're going to radio my brother. If you want me to. What will you tell him? Nothing. I'll let you tell him. Oh, I'm almost afraid to hear his voice. You make him sound so near to me. And all the time he'll be so far away. Just a voice. That's all he'll be, just a voice. I'll call him anyway. All right. Yes. Warden, EDS 34G11, emergency. Come in, Warden. Group two, identify yourselves, please. This is a call for Jerry Cross. Please come in. Jerry? Jerry, where are you? Jerry, why don't you answer? Jerry, they're going to let me die. Keep quiet. <laughs> they're coming on now. <laughs> Whatever happens, a man will always try to find some way out, even when he knows it's impossible. He'll still make a try. But sometimes, particularly on the frontiers, you're up against the problem that there isn't any way out. You're up against it. Wait, I didn't hear I... He said goodbye, little sister. I had so much more to talk about. He knew that. Was it really him? It was your brother. His voice sounded changed. Ten years ago, he was a little more than a boy. Now he's a man. Voice has changed. Did I, did I sound frightened when I talked to him? No, you sounded fine. Oh. How long do I have? Oh, a little while. What'll happen to me afterwards, I mean? Nothing, I guess. I'll just go on floating in space, isn't that it? Something like that. May I see? See what? Out there. Can I see it on the view screen? Yeah, sure. There. Well, there's nothing there. Just nothing at all. Well, there's some stars over there. I, I didn't see them. I was thinking of Mom and Daddy. They don't even know yet I'll never be going back to them. Like I promised I would. It's funny, the things you remember. Like the time when I was only six years old. And my kitten got run over in the street. And the way Jerry held me in his arms and told me not to cry. And when I woke up in the morning, there she was on my bed. With a brand new white fur coat. Just like Jerry had promised. It was a long time after that when Mama told me Jerry had gone to the pet shop at four in the morning. He got the man out of bed and told him if he didn't produce a white kitten, somebody's neck was going to be broken. <laughs> so the man found a white kitten for me. You'll be gone soon. The little hand on that gauge will go back to zero and the equation will be balanced again. Is it time yet? What? Is it time yet? Time? For me. Almost. How will it happen? You'll go into that compartment. It's an airlock. And that's about all. Oh, no, it can't be all. You'll do something. I'll simply push a button. And I'll be shot out into space. I told you, you won't feel anything. Yes, yes, you told me that. I'm very grateful. You're all right? I keep thinking... Everybody has to die sooner or later. It's no worse for me than anyone else, is it? Except most people don't know when it's going to happen, and I do. You understand I have no power to help you. No power anywhere could help you out here. All right. If there was just one, but there isn't. I know. Jerry understood that. Yeah. Your brother's quite a guy. He said everything will be all right. It will, won't it? Everything, yes. All right, I'm ready. Tell me what to do. When I pull this lever, that door will open. Just walk into the chamber. Please hurry up. Do... Do I walk in now? Yeah. It's 
It's cold in here. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I just really matter. Goodbye. You've been awfully kind. Goodbye, honey. Please close the door. Well, yes. there's no hatred, no malice in what I have to do. I know. Bye now. EDS 34G11, calling Group 1 on Planet Woden. Come in, please. I'm landing in just 10 minutes. have to learn in this world of ours. And some of the things that we learn make us feel that we're real tough and real strong and boy, we can take it. Next time, we've got a story about a kid who was sure he was tough. A real tough guy. Until he ran up against some people who were in the business of learning things. Uh, now sometimes you have to find out such things as whether a man's eyeballs fall out when he's decelerated too suddenly. These men are tough. They're just curious. Join us again next week on both Wednesday and Friday nights when John Campbell returns with more of his fascinating talk and stories while exploring tomorrow. Tonight you heard Mason Adams and Joyce Gordon in our cast. Script was by John Fleming. From a story written by Tom Godwin. Produced and directed by Sanford Marshall here in New York. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. You can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio